Good morning, Mr. Chairs. This is the public hearing for the meeting of November 20th. Okay. Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Chapman? Commissioner Carl Chen? Yeah. Commissioner Devonshire? Commissioner Roblo? Commissioner Christopher? Here. Commissioner Bolton Smith? Here. Commissioner Luffy? Commissioner Shannon Barron? Commissioner Voss? Here. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, this morning we're having a public hearing for the Park Terrace West, West 217th Street Historic District. And before I read it in, I just want to remind you, this was calendared on September 25th of this year. And identifying this district was the result of, of a long period of work in this neighborhood. We looked at it and surveyed it about Manhattan. We identified historic um, properties as potential resources for the environmental review process and we responded to the request for evaluation. And as a result of all of this, we prioritized this district, which is a special residential offering in Upper Manhattan uh, for our designation. And item one is LP2621, Park Terrace West, West 217th Street, Historic District, Manhattan, uh, with the boundary description as described in the agenda today. And presenting is Tracy Miner. Good morning, Commissioners. The Park Terrace West, West 217th Street Historic District, located in India, consists of a picturesque enclave of 15 20th century Tudor and colonial revival styles. Combined with an emphasis on landscape gardens, and making provisions for the automobile. The district's appealing character and historic significance is created by its uniform scale, architectural styles, and consistency of building The proposed historic district extends along the north side of West 217th Street and along Park Terrace West, as shown here in the map. It is a cohesive grouping of two-story brick houses that is surrounded by early 20th century apartment buildings and nearby parks. The more commonly seen, more commonly seen in other boroughs, these freestanding, semi-detached houses reflect the time period when they were built, using land that has been part of a large estate in the northernmost tip of Manhattan. <coughs> the neighborhood of Inwood is located at the the most region of Manhattan. The natural topography, topography of the area led to its early development patterns. Its lush hills, valleys, and several water resources determined the layout of the area. The early earthen fort on the higher elevation, the estates in the valley, and on hilly plateaus, along with Pink Ridge Road running diagonally through the center, linking it to lower Manhattan helped to determine the later street grid plan, all contributed to the later picturesque setting of the Inwood neighborhood in which the historic district is located. Inwood was once vast farmland and was historically known as Tubby Hook until 1864. Initially, initially, the land on which the proposed district was developed was part of the Isaac and Michael Dyke Farm. In 1851, it was divided, and a 26 parcel, six acre parcel, was sold to John Ferris Seaman and his wife, Andre Seaman. The Seaman estate is shown in these maps on the top, on the map on the left, and on the right in this broader context shown by the red dot. As you can see in this 1885 Robinson map on the right, the city began to develop around the edges of these vast estates in the late 19th century. Upon Anne Drake Seaman's death in 1878, the property was left to a nephew, Lawrence Drake. Drake divided the prop over the property into lots, which were sold to developers. This 1900 map showed the properties and the streets at, that were laid out at the Seaman Drake Estate property. The Seaman Estate Mansion, shown in the lower lot, on the map and in the photo on the left, remained until 1938. 
1906, the extension of the Intergoal Rapid Transit IRG subway lines spurred the initial residential development of the area, as you can see on the right. Further development was spurred by subsequent opening of the IND subway line in 1920. Additionally, the creation of two neighborhood parks, Isham Park, a gift from Julia Isham Taylor in 1911, and Inwood Park, created by the city in 1916, provided public amenities that drew developers and residents to the area. The proposed historic district was develop developed with detached and semi-detached houses in the 1920s and 30s, as larger apartment buildings were being constructed elsewhere in the neighborhood. By 1934, as you can see on this map, most of the houses had been built in the proposed <coughs> The Seaman Drake Mansion was the last portion of the original state to be developed. This 1937 aerial photograph shows the proposed historic district before the Seaman Drake House property was redeveloped, surrounded by large-scale apartment buildings. Because of the development history, the former Seaman Drake estate, the proposed historic district developed differently than other parts of it on the streets that were not part of the original urban grid plan of the area. The small scale and almost suburban quality of this enclave is rare in Manhattan. As you can see in this map, the proposed area consists of houses along the block of West 217th and the northern section of Park Terrace West, where the two streets intersect. Designed in both colonial revival from 1921 to 25, and the Tudor revival styles from 1933 to 30. The proposed district shows a high level of integrity with minor alterations, including replacement of windows and minor changes to the facade materials, such as reciting dormers or removing decorative half -tip. The picturesque streetscapes have a high level of, of integrity and possess a special character and sense of place defined by the houses uniform scale, use of period styles and materials, and similar setbacks from the street with gardens accentuating the topography. The earliest buildings in the proposed historic district are these residents along Park Terrace West, constructed in 1921 designed by architects Land, Seidel, and Moore. Colonial revival in all world appearance. The simple two-story rectangular form has evenly spaced double on windows, stepped firewalls, and side gable roof with small attic doors. Craftsman features include the textured and patterned multicolored brick and the horizontal emphasis created by the roof overhanging and protecting full width Further along Park Terrace West, <coughs> these houses were constructed a few, a few years later, between 1924 and 25, by architect Abram H. Zacharias as two family houses. Their boxy shaped hip roof with small domers, arched entry rays, and contrasting coins exhibit a strong colonial revival reference. There is also a craftsman influence with textured pattern, multicolored brick, and random stone accents. Particularly notable are the arts and crafts doors and decorative tile entry. The houses along West 217th Street were designed by Benjamin F. D. Dreisler and Lewis Kirks and C. G. The Niergaard, constructed between 1933 and 35. They were all developed by the construction firm of Heisler and Sienna as speculative properties. The Tudor Revival style is evident in their steep gables, half timbering, prominent chimneys, and turret enclosed entries. Several of the houses mirror each other across the driveway, as illustrated by the tax photographs on the right. Influenced by early 20th century modern car culture, all of these houses were built with garages 
either based in the basement or as a separate building with the rear of the lot. The houses are set back from the streets with gardens, retaining walls, and pathways that are influenced by the topography. Unusual for Manhattan, this small district reflects the popularity of many suburban qualities along with convenient access to Manhattan. This part of Inwood was advertised as country living in the city. The proposed Park Terrace West 217th Street Historic District is a picturesque enclave of residential architecture that illustrates the popularity of a revivalist style used for residential developments in the 1920s and 30s. It retains a high level of integrity and exhibits a strong sense of place. Thank you, Terry. Uh, we're going to go to public testimony, but are there any questions? Yeah, I just caught on something I had a comment on when this first came up. Uh, there's three buildings that are just to the three, look like low scale structures to the south, immediately to the southwest of the district we're designating. And, I, and my understanding is that the problem there is that their integrity is not so good? Correct. That's integrity has been altered over the years, vastly altered. Additions have been made. So they've been vastly altered and don't retain the integrity of the, the small ones you see over on the left, the picture on the left. The porches, porches have been enclosed and they've raised the story. So they don't retain the quality, unfortunately. Um, do you happen to know whether, um, you know, when you look at this district, it, it does have a, um, a very strong sense of some of the really classic neighborhoods in Queens? And so I was wondering whether the architects or developers actually did work. We know that. Well, it's like mostly in Brooklyn, from what I remember. Mm -hmm. Not Queens at all. Mm -hmm. I, maybe they all shared with each other. I am not sure. But uh, mostly in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. No, Dreisler did. Did Dreisler? Dreisler. Mm -hmm. In Queens. So one of them did. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Jackson Heights. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll go to testimony. Uh, David Tom. Hi, my name, Hi, my name is uh, David Tom. Uh, I reside at 537 West 217th Street, and today I'm also appearing for you in the Aquapar Block Association, uh, the Park Terrace North Block Association. Park Terrace North being uh, an early name for West 217th Street. It appears on some of the older maps. Uh, many of my neighbors uh, were unable to come today, so I'm appearing on behalf of the following uh, 10 properties. 527, 531, 533, 535, 537, 539, 545, West 217th Street, 81, 93, and 96, Park Terrace West. Uh, as owners, we unanimously support the creation of this district at this time for the following reasons. The historic ties to the pattern of land development in Northern Inwood from the Grand States of Siemens, Eichens, and Dykemans to today's unusual street grid and mix of building types reflective of a very specific moment of time. Uh, the unique architecture and massing from Manhattan, including our deep front gardens and narrow driveways with our largely intact architectural details. The intrinsic contribution uh, to the neighborhood character and sense of place in all seasons, be it the blooming flowers in spring or the trick-or-treaters on Halloween, we go over 400, uh, or the snowy drifts in winter. Pressing need for preservation given the underbuilt nature of the block relative to what is allowable under the recently passed zoning R7A. Uh, that has an FAR of 4. These buildings are all around 0. 0.6 to 1.2 FAR. This is further evidence, this need is further evidenced by the demolition and redevelopment of three other inward houses, uh, Cooper Street and Seaman Avenue since 2016. Accompanying this letter uh, that I'm submitting today is also a letter of support from the granddaughter of the original developer, the Kesslers, uh, of the West 217th Street block, Andrea Goldstein. We are also submitting family photos from the Cohen Steinberg family, who were residents in the 1940s and appeared in that census. We also recognize letters of support submitted by the boards at our neighbor co ops at Park Terrace Gardens and 100 Park Terrace West, and the Inwood Owners Coalition and Moving Forward and Unidos organizations. The love and care for this friendly streetscape clearly extends beyond just their current residents and owners. 
Uh, while we feel fortunate to have our block calendar for consideration, we recognize that there are many additional meritorious blocks of Art Deco and other styles of building throughout Inwood, and we hope that the Commission will explore the creation of additional historic districts in the near future. Uh, thank you for consideration today of our homes. We hope for your continued support in this designation process. Our next speaker is Pat Courtney. Good morning, I'm Pat Courtney, and I live at 50 Park Terrace West in Inwood. That's at the corner of 215th Street, so a few steps away from this district. My comments are written in full support of Park Terrace West, West 217th Street, historic district proposed in law of the Inwood's Preservation Commission on recognizing the attributes and significance of this first small historic district for Inwood, the northernmost community of Manhattan Island. For the past 16 years, I have lived in an Art Deco apartment building very close to the proposed district and so have walked these blocks. The LPC's narrative describes the contributions of the district, including its uniform scale, consistency of architectural styles and building materials, and landscape gardens that work with the topography of Inwood and its embrace of early 20th century modern car culture. These contributions to the context of the small district are critical to its coherence. The context of the district is also the main that many surrounding historical elements of Inwood related to its unique topography and rich transportation history. Broadway itself is perhaps the most significant and central such feature. Dating back, sorry, dating back to the earliest residents of Manhattan Island. Some of the remaining... Oops. Some of the... Is there something? Yeah, there is. Just go almost every week. I quit the Some of the other remaining traces of transportation history in Inwood include the Steam and Drake Arch, the elevated IRT street stations in Dyckman Street, West 207th Street, West 215th Street, the Henry Hudson Parkway and Bridge, the Packard Showroom, early automotive garages along the Broadway, 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s Art Deco apartment buildings, some adjacent to or built over subway stations, all built to be affordable to those commuting by subway and cars. And most significantly, significantly, Asham, Inwood Hill, Fort Washington, and Fort Tryon Parks, all apartments built to preserve the original terrain of Manhattan Island as destinations and recreation sites for Inwood and Greater New York City. Please designate the Park Terrace West, West 217th Street Historic District calendar today, Inwood's first. In the future, please consider the district's adjacent context, the many significant historic elements of Inwood for similar designation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eva Osasa. Hi. My name is Eva, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Eva Okada and I reside at 81 Park Terrace West and I'm representing uh, number 77 Park Terrace West, this is Gemma Florentine, and number 79 Park Terrace West, Dan Dillon. Um, Mrs. Florentine is an assisted living and Mr. Dillon um, just had surgery and he's sorry he couldn't attend. However, I spoke with both of them in great detail and um, they're all in favor um, of the historic district. I'd like to stress the fact that this is a neighborhood that is not just historic architecturally, but it has housed immigrants and people who have raised their families. Mrs. Florentine has lived at number 77 for 50 years and raised four children there. Um, Mr. Dillon grew up there. Um, his parents had bought the house and this is um, really his, his childhood home. Uh, my parents bought the house and they're immigrants from Eastern Europe. This was their American dream. And I bless them every morning because I hear birds in the morning and that's unusual in the map. And, um, you know, I think that it's important to preserve um, a sense of community 
and a sense of beauty in New York, as well as the architectural integrity of these homes. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Howard. Hello, my name is Cheryl Howard, and I am owner of 539 West 217th Street, which is one of the houses that are in the closed district. I'd like to talk to you about when I came here 26 years ago uh, to it, as a newcomer, the thing that impressed me most was that it was a place where all New Yorkers could live. Every income and every income. These houses represent more than just an architectural gem. They re represent the nature of India. We've had a lot of contention about the reason. But we need to preserve all kinds of housing. We need to preserve the history of people being able to come to New York and live and raise their families in all kinds of houses. And Inwood and these houses represent that. But many of these people have come to New York, lived in New York, the many ways that people have formed community and neighborhood over the centuries. That's what you see when you see these houses. And to have these houses torn down and have the newest form of apartment buildings built, it's not that it's a bad thing. That's more housing for people. But we're losing something. We're losing that story. The story of people coming through New York, coming into New York and having a lot. And that is the reason I think that this is for history should be stuck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robert. Inwood is a wonderful uh, neighborhood 
Uh, Inwood has got a lot of attention. We were number, I believe, five or six out of the city to be rezoned. The one thing you will find from Inwood residents, which you've already heard from testimony, is a fierce loyalty to the neighborhood, to the character. And this uh, historic district would do that is in giving residents uh, that pride. Uh, we've been featured throughout many locations as being a place that is uh, enjoyable to live in the city. Uh, in 2012, as you'll see in the text of our, uh, of our resolution, in 2012, the board, and reference that 2012 resolution, the board uh, requested that there be a survey of properties uh, to be um, landmark or created in the uh, historic district. We're happy with, with this uh, proposed action. We fully support it. The matter passed unanimously. Uh, but we also would like this to be the first of many of us. And if you ask me, you can let make the entire neighborhood in the historic district. Uh, can I get this? I have no, no real idea how you actually do that. But, um, <laughs> but if it's possible, why not, right? Uh, in our last result, also keeps an eye as to one of the, not, not a criticism, but sort of a concern that we keep our eye on, that if this goes through to this particular church, would that be it? Or is there going to be further action? We, we ask that there be further action. And also keep in mind our neighbors to the south, that is uh, Washington Heights. Um, as uh, there's movements and folks going, coming into the neighborhoods, we want to see a certain level of character and integrity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Glenn Umberger. Good morning, Madam Chair. Commissioners, I'm Glenn Berger speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is pleased to join community preservation advocates in supporting the designation of the Park Terrace West, West 20, 217th Street Historic District. It was in this historic district with a high degree of architectural cohesiveness and a strong sense of place, and the Conservancy applauds the Commission for bringing a new, new historic district to an area of Manhattan that currently has but one designated individual landmark, the Dyckman Farmhouse. However, the Conservancy believes that there is a much larger and with very well-defined section of Inwood that should also be in the historic district. The 10 city blocks west of Broadway to Peace and Avenue between Dighton and Ishman Streets are so consistent and architecturally harmonious that they epitomize the special character and sense of place that is so important to finding the boundaries of a historic district. We urge the Commission to move to counter this proposed historic district. In addition, the Conservancy would also like to reiterate that we believe there are several fine buildings that meet the requirements for individual landmark designation, along with two city parks that should be designated as scenic landmarks. These were specified in our letter to Acting Chair Bland dated July 23, 2018. We urge the Commission to also move quickly to calendar these important historic resources in the neighborhood. We believe that the LPC must ensure that Inwood's distinctive character is not lost and that there are an appropriate balance between preservation and growth and we thank the Commission for designating this historic district as the first in England. Thank you for the opportunity to present our views. Thank you. Jesse Denner. Good morning. Jesse Denner from the Historic Districts Council, and I'm also a resident of Northern Manhattan in Washington Heights. Uh, the HDC supports the designation of these 15 buildings as Manhattan's immediate historic district. Given the change coming to this area brought on by the recent rezoning, it's good that the Landmarks Preservation Commission is turning its attention to Inwood, a neighborhood rich with historic architecture and un underrepresented group in landmark designations. These stately, home these stately homes comfortably sit in the contact of this burdened area and in its early 20th century residential architectural character. This small suburban community is of a sort found nowhere else in Manhattan and quite unexpected for the borough. The enclave is best accessed by the pedestrians from Broadway via the 150th Street Stair to the time on a column lamppost, which until now were some of the only structures in the neighborhood protected by landmark status. The, this proposed historic district will be the only privately owned landmark properties in Inwood. The stair serves as a transition from the thoroughfare of Broadway to the quiet, even the Pollock area, bound by addition to Midwinter Parks, Broadway, and the Columbia University Athletic Complex. This proposed district is characteristic of being a unique pattern of development and architecture that was created in relationship to the natural landscape. The front gardens of the houses in this district accentuate the street's connection to nature and carry the greenery of the parks on into the residential blocks. Though these buildings are convenient to the city's subway system, 
It appeared that Dr. Pulaski could spend an automobile based red light, further accentuating the suburban character. Benjamin F. Dreiser, who designed the one story to revive all cops. Hot old cottage homes on 150th Street was also the architect behind 175 buildings, more modest than those at issue, developed by Real Case Associates in the Prospect Left Woods Gardens Historic District. Dreiser is identified in the designation report as one of three architects who gave the district its character and coherence. And we skip ahead. One of the buildings in this proposed district, 529 West 117th Street, possesses unique historical interest. In 1970, members of the Weather Underground attempted to firebomb this house. Then the home state Supreme Court, Court Justice John Murkoff, who was presiding over pre-trial hearings of Black Panthers that came the conspiracy to bomb public places. Three gasoline bombs were de detonated outside the building, harming no people but shattering two window panes, scorching a hanging knee, and charring the paint on Murkoff's car. A contemporary New York Times article noted that Murkoff refused to publicly discuss the incident but in fact, he said he and his family were picking it too cruelly. Of course, a few days later, he grew up a townhouse in Brothers Village. While this small collection of buildings is lovely and definitely meritorious of preservation, HCC is disappointed in the Christian's limited actions in Inwood. Inwood's distinctive special character derives in large part from the predominance of handsome Art Deco apartment buildings. Nibra possesses the largest concentration of Art Deco apartment houses in Manhattan and one of the largest in the country. It's no fun with that area typified by Art Deco apartment buildings. Well, my last commission is only choosing to recognize single family arts and craft houses. I'll submit the rest of my Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay. We do also have a letter from um, the uh, New York Unidos, uh, Nancy Preston, <coughs> supporting the historic district. Um, so thank you all for coming out, and it's great to hear so many positive remarks. Um, particularly from property owners. Um, we're, we're always very happy when people are excited about the idea of designation and embrace it. So thank you for your comments. We're going to make a motion to close the hearing today, and we will bring this item back to the vote on December 11th. So thank you all. Motion to close the hearing. Sure. All in favor? Aye. Any votes? Hearing is closed. Thank you. Today's preservation department uh, agenda with two public meeting items. The first is LPC 19-21816, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1144, lot 21, 586 Bergen Street, Prospect Heights Historic District. A Queen Anne style row house designed by William Worth and built in 1886. The application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions, install solar canopies and railings at the roof and rear facade, utilize windows, install metallic LPC permits. Modify window openings at the rear facade and modify the front area. This was last presented at the public hearing July 10th, 2018. No action was taken at that time. Good morning, Commissioners, Green Official Preservation Staff. The project is for you is 586 Bourbon Street, which is located between Carlton and Vanderbilt Avenues in the Prospect Heights Historic District. Uh, the project was first presented at the hearing of July 20th, 2018, where no action was taken. At the hearing, the commissioners expressed concerns over the concerns that the solar panels at the rear facade overwhelmed the building, and they also asked for the top floor window openings to be restored to their original condition. The applicants have made the following changes in response to these comments. 
the window openings will be restored to their original height. The solar railing at the second floor terrace has been sloped back by 12 inches. The solar panels that overlapped the window openings at the third floor have been sloped and integrated into the solar canopy. And the railing at the roof has been set back an additional 14 inches. The proposal also included the legalization of passive house windows that were installed at the primary facade without LPC permits. The commissioners asked for wood Queen Anne style work molds to be installed at the windows. And now we have updated the shop drawings to include this detail, which is based on the existing um, salvaged historic Washington Clancy is here to further expand on these changes and answer any questions you may have. We have a motion to open the proceedings. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hello, I'm Washington Clancy, CEO of Smart Roof uh, and Have Solar. And as a brief background, people who were not here last time, uh, our um, mission is to bring renewable energy to the rooftops of, of cities in general, but to do it with an architectural and, and aesthetic, uh, and aesthetic manner. And uh, we kind of welcome the complexities and challenges of working in a historical building such as this. I've been an architect for 20 years in the city and run multiple landmarks. Uh, so I know you've known the drawings, and maybe you have any questions, or unless you'd like to speak on a particular uh, drawing. There are some photographs or render of the process that show the proposed rear yard work in context. Sure. So, so this was uh, the left, obviously, the existing conditions. This was the previous uh, presentation we did in July. Uh, and if you may remember, the key comments were kind of this heavy visibility on the upper uh, railings on the roof, uh, which now we've sloped back and pushed back two feet. And you'll see in the next diagram coming up how that looks in our perspective. And secondly, we have uh, uh, we changed the angle of that, the uh, middle canopy and also taking off the, the tension rods, which were a little bit more like a Trebekka style kind of uh, canopy and turning more into an awning shape. So this is going to be a hand uh, render where we looked at uh, more of the context uh, of the buildings adjacent. Um, and as you see now with the railings on the top, uh, it, with the setback, it's, it's, uh, you see the top, top line is the penthouse roof, which was already approved the last time in perspective, and then the railing is in the foreground of that. So the, it must be noted that both buildings left and right on the rear are slightly taller than ours, so we we'll try to build that into the composition. And then midway, you can see now we've sloped that uh, canopy into more an awning style, which was felt to be more indicative of this typology. Uh, and it was actually inspired by one of the comments that we made by one of your commissioners, like why don't we, uh, instead of having a flat vertical face that covered the windows on the second floor, why not angle it a little bit more? So, for example, yes. So here, we, as you can see before, it was up to here, and from the windows we brought it down and angled it downwards, so also perspectively, from the neighbor's perspective, you want, you're seeing less of the underside of the the canopy to try and reduce the visibility. Uh, other small details such as uh, using a similar color um, to what's up on the existing uh, roof. Yeah, so I think you know, last time um, we saw this, like, most commissioners present were um, supportive of the idea of doing a solar installation uh, where our goals of sustainability and preservation could both be met. But I think felt that the amount of solar panels was a little too aggressive in terms of the solar character of the rear facade. So ask for some reduction. People were mostly supportive of the canopy, but ask for the canopy to be, be restudied and maybe um, lightened up a little. And so, um, as, as well as the so I guess I, I'm not sure in this rendering if that the piece that angles back previously covered the bottom of the window. Correct. Are the windows still being lowered? Or 
Uh, no, so um, the, the, the windows were lowered, but now that's going to be mediated and they're going to be brought back up. So they, they, they were uh, lowered and now they're to this line and now they're going to be pulled back up as, as per the existing uh, buildings. And then as you see, this was higher, so we kind of sloped that down and shifted everything more in that direction. Uh, and what I was trying to do from an architectural perspective was, if you look at uh, buildings with um, plant pots, for example, there's about an 18 inch zone where it could be a nice proportion to kind of uh, act as a, kind of a, a base to a window rather than covering it. So that was a, a gesture that that type of uh, 18 inches would be similar to a plant box. Just to clarify, though, on this section drawing, the proposed, the, the earlier proposed section and the current proposed section show the windowsill approximately the same height off of the floor, whereas in the existing condition, it shows considerably higher. Yeah, so this section is incorrect. <coughs> and after set of great to restore it, right. and the elevation shows it right. a little more accurately that they will be bringing it up further. Good. Yes, sorry, thank you. Can, can you talk about the cornice lines though? I was a little confused by that hand sketch. Uh, is it covering the cornice? Yes, so let's go to the sections of the building. Just going to look at it here. Yes, yeah, so um, yes, yeah, so this is the existing the existing gutter, existing condition. In the, in the distance is the uh, elevation of the adjacent building. Uh, so in simple terms, we're pushing back that glass solar panel uh, two feet, and it's really just it's existing between the two parapets of the adjacent uh, building. Buildings. I go to your sketch again, just like, just so that I can sure try to. Yeah. Uh, hard to read that exactly. It looks as if it might be just covering the entire cornice with your. Yeah, no, the darker line. Yes, sketch. <laughs> the darker line represents represents the uh, it's the just a uh, the, the gutter uh, and below that the cornice yeah, and then it, it slopes. Glass. And this building is, looks like it's a little bit lower than the others. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. Okay, I understand. Okay, so you can see the dark line now on the top existing. So what I was trying to do was reduce the sense of the bulk of that uh, uh, by obviously even the color where it is, but just yes. Yeah. So because your building is a little bit lower, that's why you have the parapets on either side. Mm -hmm. and Exactly. So my call was because of the darkness there, with the color of the gutter and the brick, and the panels will condition for landing with that. Can you um, just show us the windows that are approved? The house kind of window. Oh yeah. Yeah. So this was actually a salvage. Salvage from the building by the, by the clients. So basically, the proposal is to put back the salvage Queen Anne brick molding. Do you have that in section? Uh, yeah, we have these, these diagrams here. So the yellow represents the shop drawings from the, the Castle House uh, group, and then the molding uh, placed on the ground. So, so Commissioner, there was a, a late change to this particular aspect of the proposal where this profile wasn't being proposed for use everywhere, and now it is. So this is now consistent with past approvals for these types of windows. So sort of back to this step. The, the brick mold itself could be, but the, the operation change to the passive house oh, is, is, is currently at commission level. Right. Are there any other questions?
Twitter. Uh, so I think that Or independent and independent of this at all, but I'm hoping to hear what other people think. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm sorry that uh, these two very important, um, sometimes conflicting um, uh, intentions in uh, architecture, uh, preservation, and sustainability have to. For me, at least in this example, still are not resolved enough in the favor of what we do here, which is preservation. So I, I'm trying to think exactly what I would recommend uh, for their production. And I think it's the whole kicker. Um, well, I know you've reduced the angle. Um, I still think it's too much. Um, I like the awning idea. I think that's. <coughs> <coughs> and I think the rooftop, very visible rooftop, um, uh, solar panels are, are going to be pushed back or hidden or something. We've got a big roof. Uh, anyway, I think it's still overwhelming. Um, you know, not quite as much as it was, but it's still just a little bit too much for me. <coughs> um, I'm guess. Uh, I'm almost persuaded. I, I, I think that uh, we get rear facades a lot of new ways. Um, as long as the general volume involved is more or less contextual. And as I look at this image, and I look at five houses to the left, I see two ones above the second floor. Um, so and I would imagine that there are probably more to be seen in the buildings of this type. So I'm, I'm kind of OK with the canopy, even with the little weirdness in front of the window, which I think is peculiar, but I, I don't think it's peculiar enough to uh, make it inappropriate. I do think that when I look at the, the balcony railing, um, and I look at the roof plan, what, what's happened here is that you know, it's, all, it's all super good to have solar, but we also are having a deck out there, one of two one that faces front and one that faces back. So the time for the architect made a choice. They decided they wanted their solar thing and wanted to do it too. So I'm less disposed to the regarding this rail, which could have been made of flat or, or sawtooth to lose the back porch. You could have had plenty of solar passes that way without having this very visible uh, intrusion into the, the roof scape. So I, I would ask them to be either uh, eliminated or a sort of set Any other questions? OK, so I think we're uh, seven of us today. So I think that with two comments, we'll have to take a motion to approve the modification to set the rooftop panels back more and to remove the glass. I have. So I think it's too modification. Okay. Uh, in the matter of uh, 586 Bergen Street, the prospect heights for a district, this is a, uh, an application to construct rooftop and rear yard additions. <coughs> Sorry. Installed solar canopies and railings at the roof and roof facades, legalized windows to solve out and regulation commission permits, modify window openings at the roof facade and modify the front uh, area uh, I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are on the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Plastic Heights Historic District. Uh, I further note that the high performance and uh, advanced technology used in the proposed windows is consistent with previous commission approvals of the same type of for projects pursuing extremely energy efficient alterations of buildings and is supportive of similar adaptation, uh, adaptions that may occur incrementally over time at other buildings such as this one. I recommend approval, but 
noting that the proposed alterations at the area way will help provide barrier free access into the building that are lowered and reconfigured front entryways in keeping with the very condition of the entryways within this row and the historic district. That the depth of the excavation will not exceed the currently uh, excavated portion of the uh, areaway at the uh, basement entrance. That the concrete paved ramp, curbs, and retaining walls will match the color and texture of the existing concrete paving at the areaway. That the metal hatch and garbage enclosures will be finished in beige to blend with their surrounding conditions, helping them to receive some view. That the planting area, curb, and retaining wall will serve uh, to conceal the proposed metal garbage enclosures and metal hatch. That the relocation of the existing picket fence from Bergen Street to the eastern block line of the areaway will retain the existing historic features as shown in the 1940 tax bill and be in keeping with typical historic but the removal of the non-historic windows uh, did not result in the loss of the historic fabric. That the existing windows match the historic windows in terms of material, configuration, and finish. That the fixed upper sash is in a different plane from the lower sash, replicating the appearance of historic window sashes. That the change in operation at the lower sash will only be acceptable when the sash is open. <clears throat> that the construction of the proposed one-story rooftop addition will not eliminate any significant architectural features of the building. That the rooftop addition will be set back from the front and rear facades, and thereby preserving a sense of the building's original volume and scale. That the simple fenestration and neutral stucco finish of the proposed rooftop addition uh, will be consistent with the materials found at rooftop additions in this historic district. That the proposed chimney will be angled back to reduce visibility from Bourbon Street and will uh, be raised by the minimum amount necessary to comply with health and safety regulations. <clears throat> that the installation of solar panels at the rear facade will not eliminate any significant architectural or historic features of the building. That the solar panel installations at the rear of the side will be only minimally visible when seen from a great distance uh, through a break at the street wall on Carlton Avenue and will be viewed in the context of other rear yards and rear facades partially concealed by the trees. That the reconstructed one story rear yard addition will not rise to the full height of the uh, of the rear facade and the top floor of the historic rear facade will be retained and restored, uh, thereby preserving a sense of the building's original volume and scale. <coughs> that the other rear yard incursions exist in the block and that the proposed addition will not project beyond the existing rear yard addition uh, nor eliminate the presence of a rear yard work will not detract from the historic and architectural significance of the Prospect Heights historic district. Further note that the cumulative effect of the solar panels overwhelm uh, uh, the rear facade of this small residential building, uh, and therefore uh, note that the vertical solar panels in front of the third floor windows at the rear facade be eliminated, and that the solar railing roof terrace be further set back so that it's less visible in conjunction with the rear design. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, the second uh, public meeting item is LPC 19 3271 an application for an amendment to the borough of Manhattan, Block 228, Block 2325 West Broadway, and so past nine historic district. A new building built by PDD Design, uh, Design LLC in 2018. The application is to amend certific Certificate of Appropriateness 14 4750 to incorporate changes to the bulk head footprint and height.
Good morning, commissioners. I'm Abby Rumba, preservation staff. That's, this application is to amend and approve the certificate of appropriateness issued in 2013, which approved modifications to the design of the new building um, here at 325 West Broadway and modifications to rooftop additions at 23 and 25 Rooster Street, which is behind it and not part of this proposed amendment, originally approved by a certificate of appropriateness issued in 2007. So the original C of A was issued in conjunction with a modification of use and bulk for the two buildings on Rooster Street and a restorative permit returning the buildings to first class condition. So 325 West Broadway and 23 Rooster Streets are located in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District and are situated on this block bounded on the north by Grand Street, which is approximately where we're standing here, um, on the east by Rooster Street, on the south of Canal Street, and on the west here on West Broadway. So the application is to amend the certificate of appropriateness to approve the as-built conditions at the new building at 35 West Broadway, including the small pen, which appears larger than what was previously seen by the commission. So let me take you to that general rendering here. This is what was seen by the commission, and here are the as-built conditions. Um, I'm going to set this back here, and here are some of the existing, um, existing conditions photos. And the applicants are here to discuss the project in detail and answer any questions. We have a motion to open the proceedings. Second from the Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to hear this uh, application. And uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that we're back in front of you uh, on some level. This is our first uh, time coming at the end of the project. Um, we've had great success at DDG. Peter Guthrie, DDG. Um, we started off with you guys in uh, 2008 with the project in uh, NoHo, and I was uh, just reminded of this project just as a quick preamble in talking to some students recently about the landmark process and how instrumental it's been to our company and our design philosophy. Um, by honestly approaching the exchange with the commission and treating it as if it's a, a crib. So we were able to uh, find moments in projects that might not have existed and uh, refined details, and this project is no exception. So um, when we started this project, this is you know, the Soho Cast Iron District, and looking out over the rooftops, um, we, we set a very clear goal for ourselves uh, to design an utterly modern uh, building that was uh, at the same time completely respectful and contextual. Uh, I think we were very proud of the building that we created and buildings. It had two components. The, um, one, one more. Uh, so uh, this is the Worcester Street side and it was a 74, 7-Eleven, so we uh, took great care and pains, and this was our first process, uh, our first 74, 7-Eleven uh, process, and um, again, we're, we're extremely proud of our uh, preservation of those two existing uh, facades uh, from very different time periods and still trying to harmoniously work them into a very modern uh, condominium uh, project with that one. So, and one more. So this is a project that uh, was our precedent, just to get quickly into the uh, bulkhead uh, specific uh, issues. Uh, this is a project right on the uh, edge of the uh, meatpacking historic district. And we uh, had done this building just before designing uh, 325, and it has a bulkhead uh, that is uh, a green screen. And this is where we developed the idea of the green screen to to define and uh, also mask uh, some of the uh, flues and uh, pieces of equipment. And it was with uh, this project that we felt that we had uh, come to terms with accepting the modern bulkhead, the challenge of incorporating a bulkhead into the overall composition. And if you go back one slide, the historic precedent of the water towers and bulkheads that we all know are part of iconic New York uh, history, one more, to then take Carpenter and Candela, 
We're going to be building now on the Upper East Side and looking at Kendall's early uh, 1900s uh, roof space. We said, you, you have to embrace this component of a building. It is the top of the building, it's unabashed, and it's uh, a key component of the composition. Can we go one more for page two? So, bulkhead as built on the left, uh, as approved on the right. <coughs> During the process, while we were ever so careful on the Worcester Street side, uh, we were uh, keeping our eye very carefully on our aesthetic and architectural wall, and we uh, are here to disclose our rationale for why we enclosed uh, that uh, section of the upper left corner of the bulkhead. So the bulkhead itself was always uh, designed as a green screen. It was a central component of the building of the escape, but we, we embraced it. So one forward two. Uh, this is the as built condition on the left, approved on the right. Again, as Abby mentioned, this is the rendering on the right, as built on the left. This gives you a good axonometric of the screen. And what we decided to do, uh, based on coordination and learning that flues, various flues, uh, in this area here were extending uh, above this upper roof in a way that we hadn't anticipated. We decided to that it was stronger for the architectural integrity of the roofscape and this particular component of the building to uh, just keep the Euclidean geometry simple. And so we just, we just, at expense, we added steel posts and we extended this line here and kept the, the simpler data. Next. This is the view as built on the left. This is what, uh, this is the rendering uh, that was approved in 2014. As built left, approved right. As built left. Roof right. Same. This was a mock up uh, with scaffolding that, um, with a mesh around it that shows um, that straight line. Thanks. This was pre building. Thanks. And this is the finished building, uh, front facade. Uh, this is a great detail that was a collaborative effort of this body. We hadn't resolved this during the hearing, and because this hearing asked us to go back and uh, think about a better connection, we came up with what I think is just an unbelievably elegant detail that was the result of a collaborative effort. So I'd like to point that out. I'd like to point that out to students who think that this is a, a hurdle that you have to find ways to skirt. In fact, it's not. It's a great opportunity to get the feedback. Uh, next. Next existing building. Here's our building. You do see touch of the bulkhead, and there's the screen at the end. So we can end up back on the two uh, elevations. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you so much.
the side of side is much more realistic part of the side, that relationship of you know, the slightly taller side and it has the change in your that relationship with the side isn't any different than I think you expect it to be good. Um, so I think um, in some ways simplifying the bulkhead does make it a uh, simpler form and it is against the backdrop of a taller building. Can I just ask to be sure I understand that? So they came back with an enlarged uh, bulk head, not as enlarged as it was coming built. No, no, no. It was before the building was built, they came back on it. We amended this program right. to make it to allow that bulk head. That one, but yep. that one was built. That's right. still yet bigger. And then the data alignment were all in the first when they came the first time and the exactly. second time. It wasn't until it was built. So the measurements in the drawings are built exactly according to the drawings, but this particular review that was in both cases the, the data was wrong. Okay. So you got to in on this here. So what's before us now is the addition of the screening around it, not the bulk itself. That's right. And to just recognize that the, the view is not exactly as was presented. And if you're comfortable. Right, we're about to kind of feel that. Right. right. Kind of right. Kind of, but I, I mean, comment is that I'm not sure I'm as offended by the actually seeing the things that would otherwise be on the roof. Which uh, is to say I'm not sure I feel that it needs to screen. Uh, you know, I, I, that's part of the, when you look at the, the, the history, the historical photos of what the uh, rooftop cave looked like, there was a lot of stuff there. And it wasn't so slick. Who was still out of that? I was done by that in the first place. Was there not a screen at all in the original location? Well, there was. It just had the staff that shape. Yeah. And so. Um, so yes, I think that in this particular district it's typical to have a lot of utilitarian rooftop features. And so that kind of industrial character, mechanical equipment, it's in this district. I think for me it's, it also, um, I think it could be appropriate to have something a little more designed at the top of the building. Right. Thanks for me. Uh, I think there's a big difference between a visible rooftop addition that is added to an existing historic building uh, as opposed to a brand new building, which is designed of a, uh, an entirely of a, of a thing. And I think it's the right of the architect uh, to design the whole thing. In fact, the responsibility to really take it through. Um, I myself once had roof, uh, you know, uh, water towers on a, on a building I designed because I wanted them. But I don't think they had to be there at any point. And I think this is uh, perfectly acceptable. Uh, and to see a rooftop addition is no problem at all, uh, particularly in a, in a building that's designed to have it be seen. Um, so I'm not offended at all by the slight changes here. I think the idea of wrapping this and simplifying it to uh, fit on top of uh, an existing, uh, beautifully designed building, by the way, looks I haven't seen it yet, I wonder why I see it. Uh, uh, it seems perfectly appropriate uh, to me. And, uh, <coughs> In the matter of document number FPC-19-3270-1325, West Broadway in the Solo Cast Iron Story District, uh, the application is to amend certificate of appropriateness 14-4750 to incorporate changes to the bulkhead footprint and height. 
I know that this block consists largely of new buildings and low-scale industrial buildings, and that the buildings on the west side of West Broadway are outside of the designated civil cast iron historic district. I recommend approval, I'm knowing that the presence of large rooftop elements which are visible from public thoroughfares is consistent with the industrial character of the historic district, which historically featured a variety of utilitarian rooftop accretions visible from the distance, that the bulkhead is set back from the primary and secondary facades does not detract from the design of the building, the bulkhead is designed and finished to blend the finishes of the surrounding structures, and that from the north where the bulkhead is more visible than previously approved is viewed in the context of a varied roofscape against the backdrop of taller buildings and does not detract from the street scape. Second. So, Aye. Any We're going to move to the public hearing item, starting with number one. This is LPC 19-25247, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the rural Brooklyn, block 252, lot 61, 29 Drawland Street, in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District, a brief revival style row house built in 1845. The application is to enlarge a rear yard addition and replace windows. Good afternoon, Commissioner Richard Mildly, Preservation Staff. The uh, site is 29 Drummond Street, located on the north side of the western end of Drummond Street, in the junction with Furnace Street and the BQE, and the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. The building is a Greek revival style room by the house with relatively early additions, as seen in the 1940s tax plan, including raising the top floor and enlarging the top floor windows. Uh, the proposal is to replace the modern white painted 606 Gohan windows uh, on vinyl um, and to replace them with black painted 606 Gohan wood windows. Uh, also to demolish a uh, rear two story solarium and extend uh, the uh, two story rear addition. Um, to the footprint of where the uh, slab is. Uh, and to replace a deteriorated slipper clad uh, timber framed uh, rear facade. You can see uh, it's uh, sort, of, uh, sort of mortar and noggin uh, between the timber frames and a, uh, a slipper clad finish in the exterior. The design of the original rear facade is unknown, and what remains is this timber construction with not any stuff of coating. A public hearing is necessary as the rear facade will be changed to a new design for the court. And the west side of the proposed rear addition um, will be uh, visible from a public thoroughfare, and also to determine the appropriate window configuration and finish of the south primary facade. Uh, the architect, Anna Vasquez, and the uh, Ms. Kubrick's architecture design are here to answer any questions. Thank you. 
objects and condition of the rear facade of stucco over wood framing, and that the party walls of the house are wood framed with brick. No evidence was presented that the rear facade was ever brick, and we believe it is much more likely that the original condition over such framing for the rear of the house of this era would have been wood fabric or shingles. We feel that any rebuilding of the rear facade could either maintain the existing condition of stucco finish, or use a siding finish more typical of the assumed original degree. Blackwood or shingles, either in wood or hardwood, would be preferable to break the beam. At the least, a complete rebuilding of the rear facade and a new finish should necess necessitate more research and justification for such an intervention. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Um, we have a resolution from Community Board 2 recommending approval of the application. Um, would you like to respond to those comments, specifically the condition of the upper floors and why they need to be rebuilt, and then the choice of brick and how that fits in with the context, and the size of the proposed addition and how that fits in with the context? Yes, um, we did use some problems on the upper floors and we found that it's um, just a sign out of the set of projects with the texture. Um, we did do some probes on the upper floors and we did find that it's um, wood framing with some brick in there. In between, we did a lot of research and we don't have any um, proof of what the back as that used to be in the, in the back. Um, and we just thought brick would be appropriate. Um, it's finished that it's in a lot in the neighborhood, so we thought it would be appropriate for the house. But your investigation um, resulted in the, your belief that it needs to be reconstructed, or is it a Oh, the house is not in good shape, so it needs to be reconstructed. They all the floors. Um, it's really not cheap. We did a lot of probes with brought engineers and we really strongly believe that it's the right thing. There was a uh, comment about the size of your rear yard addition. Can you speak to that in terms of its relationship in the block plan? Yes, yeah, so if you go to the pictures, um, the neighbor, Bergman Geraldman, already um, has a new extension was recently built and we plan on matching the exact massing of the neighbors. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Any motion to close the hearing? No, motion to close. Favor? Aye. Any thoughts? Sir? And I think that the rear yard addition is the building is one of the pair, and the rear yard addition seems to match the others, and it doesn't have, it doesn't even have a negative effect on the rest of the green space and the location. Historically, there were often, we found that wood frame buildings often had brick facades and other materials in the back. Um, we don't know for sure what material is here, but we do think that brick at the rear is also a common material and found in this block. So I can be comfortable with it. That's great. Yes. By comparison to some of the changes we've seen in very odd extension, this is relatively modest. Um, and the willingness to follow the footprint of the, um, of the neighboring uh, building, I think, is a, is, a, is a pretty good concession. Okay, thanks. So, we'll have a motion to approve. Yes. Page 5, LGC 19-25247, Drawman Street, the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. The application is to enlarge on the rear of the location and reverse windows. I know that the building's scale, style, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the building of the historic district. I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not damage or destroy any significant historic or architectural features, that the proposed 6 over 6 double Hollywood windows at the front facade will be the keeping of historic windows to be found on houses built in the mid 19th century and will be compatible with the early alterations to the house including the increase in the height of the windows at the top floor. That the proposed black finishing windows will be keeping the inconvenience of the dark finishes of the 
the owners found in this house and the majority of houses in this row since the early 20th century and will support the community of the row. That the proposed rear addition will not rise to the full height of the building or extend to the rear lot line and will align with the neighboring rear addition in terms of number of floors and projection into the central green space, thereby helping to retain the defining aspects of the building's original scale and mass and not overwhelming the neighboring house from detracting from the central green space. That the addition to feature a solid to water ratio, which will be compatible with the residential scale and character of the third house. That the addition to the area, when seen from the public thoroughfare, will only be visible from a limited vantage point within the context of the secondary dot line facade and the facade of the public building. That the side wall of the addition will match the, the existing lot line facade in terms of materials and finish and feature a simple profile will help it remain a discrete presence within the streetscape. That the replacement of the timber frame and stucco north rear facade is warranted by its deteriorated condition. That the design of the historic cladding of the rear facade is not fully known and that the proposed brick cladding will be in keeping with the cladding typically found at the least this age, including any of the houses within this row. And that the proposed work will not detract from this special historic and architectural character of the building and the local heights historical structure. Thank you. Okay, next is item number two, LPC 19-29651, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 248, lot 35, 122 Montague Street in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Street Revival Style House, built in the 1840s and altered for commercial use prior to designation. The application is to install door surrounds, awnings, sign in, and garbage for the building. Good morning, Commissioner, and we would and preservation staff. The application is to install the door surround awning the sign in at a garbage enclosure at 122 Montague Street. Uh, it's located between Henry and Hicks Streets in the Oakland Heights Historic District. So we have the 40s tax photo and our designation photo shows a series of alterations that have happened at the uh, sort of two-story base of the building, turning it into commercial. The close up of our designation photo. And this was um, not current conditions, but pretty uh, contemporary conditions um, showing the two stories with the commercial tenants. So the work will take place at this two story commercial base. Uh, the entrance to the ground floor storefront is here at the and the entrance at the west is shared by the second floor commercial tenant and the residential floors above. Currently, the same tenant occupies both commercial floors, and they are proposing to install projecting wood door surrounds at the existing metal and glass ground floor entrances here. Uh, install canvas clad awnings with fixed metal armatures at the second floor, featuring painted lettering and logos at the skirt. Installing a metal sign band that spans the width of the ground floor entrances, featuring pin mounted metal lettering and an applied graphic. And then removing the existing metal railings and installing a garbage enclosure perpendicular to the facade and adjacent to this west entrance. And the garbage enclosure is wood slats with an integrated planter at the top. This bracket sign will be reviewed at staff level. So moving forward, uh, this is a close-up of the installations proposed. There is included in the presentation, um, just to make you aware, an initial scheme, which is not being proposed. This shows up in elevation and another axon rendering. Uh, so this was how the work originally came in with the application. It is now, this is the only thing that we be concerned with is the conditions here in the proposed elevation, uh, just to clarify that. And there are further details of the projecting signage, garbage enclosure, here it is in plan. Um, so this will be anchored into the concrete. This is the proposal here. Profiles of the door surrounds, 
graffiti, they did the wood. Um, contextual photos of the, the adjacent corners of Montague and Henry Street, showing uh, quite a few commercial second floor awnings. Uh, this is our building here. Architectural street state photo showing the variations of the area. I think we can go back for a second. Also, um, why don't you both say your name? Well, <laughs> uh, no, you can come up and say your name for the So, it's like a funny Hey, uh, my name's Dodge, the, the architect working with my client to help resolve some of the issues at the site. I think one of the issues we found is just, a, I mean, there's a couple things that are important. One thing I've noticed when I walk down Montague Street, is there a laser with this? Uh, it's pretty. It's just the importance placed on all the entries to all the commercial establishments. The second issue is probably not so glamorous. It's just how everybody kind of deals with trash on the street. And one thing that I kind of noticed when I came to the site is there's just there's residential units above the bottom two floors of the commercial. There's just some trash everywhere. I don't know that I'm going to solve this problem immediately, but my idea was to try and hide the trash cans away in something a little bit more copacetic than the facade. The reasons we're proposing the surrounds is I feel like when I come to the building on the street, it's from the missing tooth and the smile. And there's nothing there of any significant value that was left over from the original building. I don't know that I have the right answer, whether it's some sort of brief revival detail or some sort of molding around. It would be nice to give some sort of importance to the entrance of the building. I think Montague Street is defined by this sort of commercial corridor in the neighborhood. People expect to have a certain feel. Um, just when I go back to my building, it's just, it's uh, not, I mean, we could not do anything. It's just not very noticeable. And while we don't want to propose anything that's not contextual or only dramatic, I'd just like it to feel a little bit more compensatic than the rest of the street. So just as a designer and an architect, the two issues that were really sort of struck to me is um, what happens here around the doors. This is, if you look closely, there's some sort of like tutor infill that I can't really explain or define, but we're not proposing to alter it or touch it, we're just going to leave it in place. And also, what we do with the nasty trash cans that are on the side. I've worked with uh, the Brooklyn Heights Historical Association trying to find some sort of meaningful way of dealing with the entries, but something that's not too overly done or too detailed. But I think when you look at the pictures of the existing buildings, how do you deal with this in some sort of meaningful way? There's these old railings that we're proposing to get rid of. There's that Tudor, I don't know what that is, I explain it. Um, and what's existing around these doors right now is just some ratty old 2x8s and 2x4s. This little piece of molding, which is not original, is the only thing there that gives me a hint of what may have been, but it's not even contextual to the original building. Can you also just kind of on that one part of Montague Street? There are buildings with stoops and areaways, and there were a lot of projections into the sidewalk. Is that true of your side of the street as well, where your, um, does your garbage enclosure kind of project out? As far as other areaways, or uh, well, this, this is just down the block. From me. This is uh, on that side of the street. It's crossing and heading. So you can see here. There's another series of garbage enclosures. This is on the other side of the street. There's another series of garbage enclosures. There's this big metal garbage enclosure. And also areaways yes. as well. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Kim. Uh, the awnings on the second floor, do they really need to have um, the pattern and the name? Oh, uh, no, that's so, that was one of the, so the marketing team from Halstead originally came with that's what they wanted. The reason we left the initial scheme was all the comments we got from CB2 was to reduce the graphics on the second floor. 
So if you look at the proposed scheme, I believe this is if we remove all the graphics on the top. So that's all gone. It's just a simple monotone colored canvas. This was what was initially proposed. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess one. Uh, um, are there other sign bands that are as extensive as this sweeping across the entire front? Over both the storefront and a residential entry? Well, here's the thing is now, um, I, I don't know that I found one per se, but the issue is this is also Halstead's entry. So Halstead has both floors in this building. The residents also share that doorway to get up into their uh, the residential units above. Is there no internal stair? No, nope. like, like no, nope. no steps. No, nope. they got to go out this door, in this door, and out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. We may come back. Overall, we think this application represents a substantial improvement over the existing condition, and we would support approval of the sign band, bracket sign, awning, and garbage enclosure as presented. Regarding the door surrounds, these still need a little work. We find the crown molding at the top of the pilasters and the top of the door frame to be overly elaborate, and we recommend a more careful working of these simple classical details. Regarding the second story awnings, plain holstered lettering is appropriate for the skirts, consistent with the LPC rule for awnings. We're glad to see that the top of the awning is now playing um, as is seen in the neighboring brokers storefront awnings. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? We have a resolution from the committee board which recommends the approval of the design with the exception of the graphics on the upper second floor of the awnings, which uh, is if somebody has an opinion on the moldings around the door, I'm happy to work with somebody. It's just, okay. you know, I'm just, all we are trying to do is echo what was up here. All right. Thank you. Any motion to close the hearing? Second. All in favor? Also, because the building is so symmetrical, we 
These two pictures show the conditions prior to the comprehensive restoration that took place at the front facade. Uh, you can see the stoop, uh, historic stoop had been removed and it had a basement entrance at this point. Um, the owners obtained a permit to restore the historic front stoop um, entrance surround and the door to match the 1940s tax photo that you see here. This picture again shows 170 in its uh, pre-restoration conditions along with um, the houses, the other three houses in this row, um, all of which you can see had alterations to the surrounds um, from the historic photos. This drawing shows what the approved configuration has been. There are arched panel wood doors. Uh, wooden glass door with solid panels located at the upper corners above the door, uh, narrow pilasters, and a shallow sloped pediment. And then this design shows the pediment and doors that were installed uh, by the applicant. The opening for the door was widened, the pilasters got a little bit uh, wider, and the, the pediment was enlarged. Uh, it also projects out further from the facade. Uh, and they installed glass panel infill panels above the, the arched door openings. These are photos of the existing conditions. Um, so you can see the installed door and surround. Uh, and this slide shows the pre-restoration condition here, the approved rendering um, showing what was approved to be rebuilt, and then the existing condition that the applicant is seeking to utilize. The architect is here to present historical justification for the change and also to answer any questions. Good morning. My name is Sean Watts. I'm a partner at the University of Studio Architecture. And um, I just thank you for the introduction. I just want to go back through and give a couple of thoughts about why we did what we did. Um, largely, uh, the changes we made um, were responding to some field conditions, which I will clarify. And um, as we, uh, through the construction process, became more familiar with our own uh, building and the nuances of the construction of the reconstructed facade and of um, spending more time in the neighborhood um, and looking at more kind of precedents around the neighborhood um, made a few changes. I, I want to make a general statement that, um, in general, we try to color within the lines. Um, and uh, we were a little surprised at, um, we sent the, the, uh, the, the photos at the end sort of proudly uh, showing what we had done and, um, in the context of our original, original approval. Um, we were hoping that it would all be okay at staff level, so I'm a little embarrassed to be up here right now. I'm showing you this uh, exchange, but um, anyway, to, to start off, um, the, uh, the opening that we, uh, we, we did um, <coughs> bring the parlor floor windows back down to the, to the level they were originally and restored the heavier rusticated Italianate window sills. In the process, we realized it was possible to match the brick that we, uh, that we had on the side and went through it unpainted. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we discovered also that the original door, the original door, the, the masonry opening was a little bit wider than we had hoped it would be um, once we um, cleaned off the brick and took a, took a hard look at it. So we, we came up with a solution that was, uh, I think our original, our original proposal was a little um, narrower and, and actually a little narrower than the neighbors we subsequently learned. And the, the height of the head of the opening was a little taller than our windows, whereas the neighbors had the, 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 the head of the opening in alignment with the windows. So that were, there were two things we did, um, just to lower the opening a little bit to align it with the windows. And it's, um, it's uh, uh, two and a half inches wider on either side than the five inches total than the, the neighboring buildings. Um, the, uh, the, the implication for the, the more Italianate um, uh, uh, surround was basically to harmonize a little bit better with the heavier recipe base and the window sills. Um, it's, 
is closer to what we saw in the style guide and what we saw kind of around the neighborhood, um, which we which we liked. Um, the justification for it, we went from, I don't know if I mentioned this, we went from two panels to one panel, partly because we had to lower the door a bit. Um, the, the glass uh, in the corner, honestly, was just a little bit of inspiration. We picked up walking around the neighborhood at night, um, seeing the historic door at 135 Pacific, um, which clock away. That had, uh, it is admittedly different. It has the, the um, glass pants on with the, with the break. Um, but the, the original glass side lights, we saw it at night and they were glowing and we were just inspired and thought it was beautiful. So we put it in. And that's where we are today. These guys, that's glass. And I think that, um, I think that covers it. Um, as far as our, uh, are there any questions? We'll take public testimony and probably come back. Jesse Dennett. Jesse Dennett from the Historic District's Council. We are telling Mark to not to approve the Inglewood Assault Door that it always is our custom. We demand that the return of the large transom to the solid and built panels as there's no right room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think so. Thank you. 
is proportion to the door are minor enough that I can accept them, particularly with the explanation of the original. Or I can't really accept them, but you know, interesting old modern sort of interpretation of the, the upper um, panels of glass I think should be restored in the bank of the Otherwise, I can't. I, I think I think the um, fact that this is a reconstruction of a, a change to this house is not an opinion that we there was going to be a full restoration of that modified condition. The headers of the windows aren't being modified. Uh, there are other details that you can see in the start photos. I think the fact that a standalone entry, the original one was not a whole lot different from the proposed in terms of the snow quality. The only thing I would I would have said had this been um, presented earlier is that if you look at this surround relative to the other reconstructed surrounds, the wood blasters was a bit skinny. Um, and they made the choice when they took that extra width give it to the doorway and not the blasters. I don't think that's necessarily the right choice. I don't think that enough to stand up to um, I personally think that the little triangles are okay. Yeah. 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 Brooklyn, block 1223, lot 5. 
and then it's having the St. Mark's happen in the ground and it's more of a really historic history. A Renaissance Bible style class building is run by Frank S. Lowe and Gold Circuit 1980. And the application is to create an ad rate. Good morning, Commissioner Julian, Mr. Kennedy, Federation staff. See, uh, 97 St. Mark's Avenue is located on the north side of St. Mark's Avenue at the corner of Kingston Avenue and St. Mark's Avenue in the Crown Heights North 3 Historic District. The proposal is to install a barrier free access entrance which will be located on the Kingston Avenue facade. So, for reference, uh, the St. Mark's Avenue facade is the main entrance here with the store, and the proposed entrance will be located on the Kingston Avenue facade. The existing window will be shortened, and the new at grade entrance door, door will be installed below the window and without altering the width of the masonry opening. A small portion of the modern area with the curb will be removed for barrier free access to the new door. Uh, the renderings also show uh, restorative work proposed by the applicant that is uh, being reviewed at staff level. And the architect is available to answer any questions. Is there anything you'd like to add? Any questions for the applicant? Okay. You may come back to your question. Okay. Does anyone want to speak on this application? And I guess we jump the work. So, are there any questions? Okay. 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 Great insulation. It's a portion of the foundation. Great. In the middle of the Avenue. great entrance. College Road in the Historic District, a house built in 1953. The application is to legalize the construction of a deck and alterations to the entrance without OPC permits. Thank you. 
So once you, this is the rear of the house, and this is the deck at the rear of the two stories, and then this is the side of the deck. And the reason why you're seeing this is because the master plan allows for a deck either at the rear or the side.
here with the new area of residence um, with the new design. Uh, the second is to remove the paint throughout the front facade and replace the windows with metal windows throughout the front facade. So here's the existing, here's the proposed, here's the design component of the areaway railing. And we'll back to these in a second. I wanted to show you they did some paint removal at certain portions. You can see that here. The third part of this proposal is to re construct the rear facade and install this glass cladding featuring punched windows at select locations and large openings and others. Here's the existing rear facade. And here it is from across the way. You can see there's a rear addition and then um, the top of the rear facade is set back. So here's the existing axon and here's the proposed. Here are some renderings of what they're proposing at the rear. And we'll all come back to that. And the final uh, part of this proposal is to replace two skylights at the roof with a bulkhead mechanical units and railings and raising chimney flues. Uh, the work at the roof will be visible over the front facade here. And as you go down Wharton Street to the east, you'll see you'll catch glimpses of it over here. And so I will take you through. Here are the um, mock-ups. Here's the skylight that we're proposing to remove, as well as the bulkhead um, skylight here. So with that, Anthony is here to discuss all of these in detail. Good afternoon. My name is Wilfred Hernandez. Um, as you can see, it's in the lower left side of the Irish Village. It sits in the middle of the street, um, off the vent, coming from Bedford Street. So it makes it very visible. Um, there's also three other bulkhead additions along on the same block as that we're building. And they're all newly constructed within the last 10 years. Um, here you see that the only building that pops up that's not brave would be the 54 Morning. And it does not blend into the rest of the same context. On top and bottom, you'll see the existing railings of other buildings. The top railings are from 40 to 40 more, more inch to 52 more inch. The first one on the bottom row is what we're proposing, and the rest to the right will be the other existing railings. Um, here, you just see general site contacts around the block and also on the roof of the building. On the left side, you see the tax photo, which is not painted, you see the different colors, and also on the right, which it is painted white, currently photo. Um, on the left, you see the existing front facade, and the right only changes you'll see are the front railings, the little changes are the front railing and uh, the bulkhead on top. Also, they that the new proposed chimney for the kitchen as well. Um, the left is also existing axon. You'll see that we are getting rid of, we're extending the chimneys of our neighbors to be over the bulkhead. And also we're going to match the, the new proposed railing on the roof to match the one at the lower level. Same color material. Um, on here you'll see all the changes. You'll see the changes to the windows. The new button. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Now, this building has been painted for a very long time. Correct. How do you know that, that you're going to find that underneath? Um, we did some probe. We did find the uh, historical um, brick. We did find some that did not match the uh, original brick. Okay. Are you going to have lots of like deep in patterns of crappy brick mixed with gold brick that's not going to be very attractive? Uh, we did find a sample that matches very, very close to it. So we did bring that today. So your intention would be that if you do find mismatched brick, you're going to pop them out and put in a new brick with a mesh for all the work you find. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and also, you see they're doing the head at the top of the windows, so we're storing those so they're very um, oxidized and broken places. Uh, here you'll see more details of the probes that we spoke about. Um, the third picture on the right, you'll see the existing brick and also the this dashing brick, which is where the scoop used to be. And you see the paint's very bad condition to kill it off many areas. Also the lower level paint's killing, we're proposing to do brownstone there. And you see many of the elements of the 
document itself missing, so we would want to restore that and replace the missing evidence. Um, here you see the existing, rather than on the left hand side, it's very simple. Um, we like to redesign that so that we more, try to relate more to the balcony, which is very ornate and detailed. And we received our inspiration for some of the roads on top of the railings from the center of the balcony itself. Um, here you see a section of the existing. On the bottom right corner, you see an area being excavated. They were proposing to do uh, uh, extension to create the, the gym. And we're here, so we go to the back, and you'll see that we're getting rid of the brick in the back of the side. And we're proposing to do a channel glass. Uh, we're removing the brick. Uh, the top four that's been added between 1921 and 1940, and also the, the top terrace has also been added. It's not original, as we saw that in the Sandborn maps. And, and as you see, there's seven different type of windows, different materials, different periods, and they're, they're single pane, double pane, aluminum, wood, and we're trying to bring it all to one device design, doing a channel glass, and also doing the casement windows in the back with the uh, animals as well. Uh, these are images uh, from the rear side. The first picture you'll see that there has been um, a process the backyard. Uh, neighbors have also done a renovation to rear facades using glass as well. Um, on the second picture you'll see that the top floor and the floor below are mismatched bricks from the addition that occurred in 2019. 40s, um, and here you'll see that the windows, in the big picture, you'll see that the windows do not match. And you'll see that the context of the neighborhood and the middle. And on the lower right, the left side, you see that the, on the west wall, in the back, the wall is deteriorated and the bricks are small. Uh, here you see the next one, and we're proposing to extend our neighbor's chimney into the bulkhead, and also removing the Break as I mentioned earlier. Here we have two renderings, one at daytime, one at nighttime, and also the renderings in street context. The reference. And we do have a couple references here to show um, other channel glass proposed. One's the Pratt Institute of Brooklyn, one's the Glen Oaks in Queens, and this is the residential project we found in Spain. We've also found a few other projects like um, that have been converted the river sides to more glass or a different material, which is not the brick which was originally made. Which some examples are 80, 80 West Washington Street, 92 Jane Street, 44 West 11th Street, 892 Greenwich Street, and 233 West 11th Street, all in Greenwich Village. Um, these are just images of the, where it's visible at the bulkhead. You can see it's up from 8D. You can get some glimpses of it. There's the bulkhead or the the chimney. Um, here you see the first one. It's outlined, it's zoomed in on the top right. It's, it was very little, less visible during the summer, obviously, with the vegetation, vegetation covering it. And now that winter's coming, you do see it um, more. And this is B. Again, you see mostly the top of the railing of the bulk and the bulk itself, and the extension of the neighbor's chimney. And here you see some of the bulkhead and the railing that we're proposing at the parapet level, and also the chimney. And this is nearly the front, you just see a slight glimpse of the, of the chimney. And this is the picture of the mountain itself, and the condensing unit in the second or the last picture, which is set back all the way to the back of the facade. Um, here we have the bulkhead itself, it's made out of stucco. Glass, the uh, railing would match the same color as the parapet and also the lower level railing that we're proposing. It's all the black. And we're also, um, if you see the picture, you see that that has been set back as much as possible with uh, just having a small space for the projectors. Here you have uh, details of the railing itself. I'm trying to do some examples, you know, it's not for a game, trying to make it less visible. I'll set it two inches off the parapet wall. Um, then we're also getting rid of the windows, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're closing up with hella aluminum cladded windows with wood in the side. And on the bottom, we're doing, in the back of the other side, we're doing aluminum smart glass. 
and just these other virtual windows show that the, the space of the mass itself is not going to change. And there's going to be double plays compared to the single plays that are currently existing. Again, same thing. Um, single plays and double plays, and it's a little bit thicker, but it's more energy efficient. And in fact, you see the different array of the different windows. Some double base, some some glazed, and in some cases they kind of double funk. And we're supposed to do one window type and one material throughout. These are just general plans of the building. So that's it. You have a question, Michael? Yeah, so the portion of the, the new bulkhead that's visible, is it the mechanical room, the elevator, bulkhead, the stair? What do you see? Do you um, see what you see? We, there is, there's a stairs and access to the top. There's a, I know it's in it, but I'm thinking when you do your visibility studies, yes. what part of that new box are you seeing? Is it is the, the top the, left part? Yes, the front Which is mechanical and elevator bulk, right? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. I, I would like a very quick public primer for me on paint versus uh, brick facades of houses of mid 19th century. Or, do we have both? Both legitimate? Or were they all unpainted and then some became painted, etc.? Uh, yeah, not claiming to be an expert on this topic. I think in terms of the projects we've seen before us, it's, it's certainly fair to say that you could have both and it either could be considered significant depending on when the uh, changes were made, if they were part of, a, say, a comprehensive redesign of the facade and the paint came in at the same time that perhaps uh, uh, details were simplified, such as shaping off the profiles of the lintel, um, and then in part a way to hide some of those uh, modifications, but in other ways just to sort of simplify the design itself, have sort of a sleeker look, a more modern look. So I think we see things that are in between, sort of the pure original condition, um, and then maybe a later alteration it really runs the spectrum. But in this particular case, I think the, the staff notes uh, try to identify that you know, there, we know there was a well-known artist that resided in this house. There were period alterations that did occur at this facade uh, that have been maintained pretty consistently, not in all cases, but pretty consistently over time. And so perhaps there's some significance to maintaining the paint and finish in this particular case. Um, that being said, the commissioners have uh, certainly approved removal of paint on, on, on many of these types No, I, I'm aware of kind of art history, but I just really wanted the history. But we're going back to federal brick revival style brick houses in New York. Were all of them without paint initially or not? Some of them painted yeah. from the very beginning. I think in our experience, some of the very early federal buildings had a softer brick, and those we don't know originally, but certainly those maybe we've seen have been painted over time. More over than time. Over time. time. Initial. <coughs> right. And as far as we can tell. And then I think the revival buildings we transition into the mid-19th century were historically unpainted. Um, and then in some districts there is another sort of period of change in this particular district in the early 20th century. There's the whole period of the artist period and in those um, at that time a lot of the Greek revival brick facades or Italian facades were altered um, with the removal of the stoop, creation of a basement entry and, um, and applying a paint on the facade. In this case the height of the building was raised an additional floor to create the studio space. Um, and the ironwork was added, and um, we often see different styles employed in the future. So a Mediterranean revival sure. style, and that the paint relates to that period. And style. also the paint smooth over all these right. changes into the same. Following up on that, I have a next question. What do you, what do we make of? What was obviously an interim period on this building before the 1940 tax code, or, or, or it is phase one. When I look at the tax photo, I see a uh, very ornate wrought iron balcony that was added, and I also see coins around the upper floor windows 
And I also saw completely shaved window heads, right? And now, if you look at the building, we see cast iron uh, lintels uh, that have been added to that. So I mean, was this a case of a kind of uh, tuberization of the house, which might be more consistent with what one sees at the top of the coins, or a Spanish, okay, a Spanish something? Because that coin business at the top is very decorative very not in keeping perhaps with the kind of more smooth, shaved off, you know, cleaned up modern instinct uh, of, let's say, the neo neoclassical uh, work that one might see. So what do you make of it? So Commissioners, the, uh, these lintels were reinstalled um, at staff level in, I believe, the 1990s. So they have a permit to reinstall these after the district was uh, designated. So. Um, I didn't have the exact one for you, I apologize, um, but I do know that that was a staff level approval to install these new lintels. Um, everything else I think is, is um, similar to what it was at the time of the tax photo, other than the replacement of all the windows. So these had been replaced at staff level also in the 90s um, to have some different configurations um, to do the transom like that. Previous commissioner approval and they do not need to Yes. And do you think, are the coins still surrounding the studio window and just under the paint? Or is it kind of Yes. Yeah. They're, they're there based on site visit. Um, it, it is still there. <coughs> right. You can see it there. Looks like the brick that's exposed up there is not the same as the brick in the main body of the house. Right. You can see the change. Here and here. Where they raised the house up. Exactly. And then you can see it here where the stoop used to be as well. Where it is. There, probably not. Any other questions? <coughs> Jesse Denham. Jesse Denham for the Historic District Council. HTC is concerned about stripping of paint on the front facade and removed an important layer of history from the Spanish Village building. While we are generally opposed to modern proposals to paint historic brick buildings, this surface treatment was a deliberate modernization of the time, which included the removal of the stoop. Removing it creates an ungainly design hybrid. The painting of the front facade was likely done concurrently with the construction of the studio addition in the early 20th century and represents an important part of this building in Red Village's history. Artist Paul Cavanaugh lived here during an important part of his early career. He was where he painted the 1930s old work that would gain him fame and notoriety as a satirist and painter of gay themes, the Fleet's Inn. The Fleet's Inn, delicately painted in mid tempera, depicted carousing drunken sailors and heavily implied illicit heterosexual and homosexual behavior. When shown in the WPA exhibition in Washington, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy demanded his removal from the exhibition, had this whole scandal the best piece of luck an artist could ever have had. <laughs> the historic interventions of the historic of the monitor skylight and studio windows on the rear also serve to tell the story of this building. And although not visible from the public way, it should be retained for their historic value. We particularly object to the wholesale removal of this art tower at the rear and its replacement with an, with an entirely channel glass facade. This design is apparently based on commercial and institutional precedents having no relevancy to this block and entirely inappropriate to the Grand Village Historic District, which is why I've got that conference. Thank you. Thank you. Christabel Goff. Christabel Goff for the Society for the Architecture of the City. Now that Greenwich Village is becoming a bedroom community of Wall Street, it is easy to forget the history that made it different from other townhouse neighborhoods, but also forgetting that historic districts can commemorate the history of the place. From 1857 until quite recently, Greenwich Village was a magnet for artists. We could exhaust our three minutes just naming all the well-known American artists who worked in this district and its environments from Frederick Church and Winslow Homer in the Tech Street Studios, to de Kooning and his school of abstract expressionists who made New York the avant-garde center of the international art world. Paul Cadmus had a studio at Victor Cornwall's. 
street. The fact that puts an additional star on the map, remembrance of that history that led to our Stonewall National Historic Landmark, because Cadiz, need we say, was one of the eminent mid-century artists who was openly gay in his treatment of his subject matter, which so upset actually the late people's see. In the earlier 20th century, when, when a certain elite had moved up town, landlords subdivided large Greenwich Village townhouses into multiple dwellings and created new studios with their studio windows and skylights. Usually in old attics that could not be code as rental apartments, this is an actual issue. Many of them removed stoops and renovated their fronts to look bohemian with bright colored paint or stucco and exotic decorations of tile and ironwork meant to recall foreign places and clamor away. Because it is such a studio building, 54 Morton should not be stripped of its distinctive color. The overly transparent inner wall, a lantern of contemporary aspirations, would put an end to the lovely nocturnal views of dark city gardens in the backs of one of the district's best preserved roads, devaluing the great houses of St. Louis Place. Thank you. Louisa Winchell. Hello, Louisa Winchell from the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. GBSHP supports most of the proposed changes to and restoration of the front facade of the building, but we strongly oppose the proposal for changes to the rear of the structure. The restoration of the front
storefront, even though it's multiple buildings, they kind of read and are experienced as the same building. It's a very distinctive building with a very robust storefront that's been more or less maintained. Um, so for me, the, that, that normal leeway that one has, on a, let's say, on a Columbus Avenue streetscape, would not be appropriate here. Uh, and I think the conformity should be much more uh, rigidly enforced. Uh, and I think that would go not only for the surrounding door, but for what seems to be modifications of the storefront itself. Um, I mean, you have a very, very robust and strong storefront immediately adjacent to it. I don't see why we could uh, uh, seek to restore that and use that as the template for this. I personally have a problem with brown, with brown stores, brown stores, which I think would fit with it now, but I think it has to be within a much more uh, uh, restorationist approach. Okay, and I think in terms of having to conceal something behind, we've done that with you know, a opaque glass transfer. Uh, and in this case, there already seems to be some sort of panel that might be. Just again, put the transom bar back where it is onto the surface bay, which matches where it is over the bays to the right, you'd have plenty of space for a blank panel that's either looper or spandrel of looper or some other foundation material that would, again, restore the original while allowing them to put in there. Stores. Everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay. There's no uh, about the uh, oh, the bracket sign. The bracket sign and the so like light. Metalwork and will detract from the unity of the design of the metal framing elements at the remainder of the facade. 
the proportions, details, and finish of the white painted wood surrounded on harmonious with style and design of the building and drawing your attention to the installation. So that the replacement doors and transom are not all related to the size of the bay and the doors or transoms of other entrances of this facade in terms of proportions and size. So the size of the bracket sign exceeds the size allowed by zoning. But the installation of two large mounting placement signs resulted in unnecessary penetrations of historic masonry. And then the proposed light fixture would be common to placement and installation through the metal work above the entrance will damage historic fabric. Therefore, I recommend the historic metal framing and service entrance surround be painted and match the color of the, the painted finish of the surrounding metal work. That the modern wood infill be removed and underlined wood framing be restored. That new infill be installed in the entrance bay, which will closely match the size and proportions of the entrance infill at other entrances of the facade, and be compatible with the style of the building in terms of materials, design, and detail, and finish. But the practice sign be replaced with a smaller sign, compliant with zone, and anchored to the storefront infill, uh, with all associated holes in the base to be appropriately patched. Um, and that the light fixture be eliminated or changed to a discrete fixture incorporated into the bracket for this sign. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, so it's approved through those modifications, and Julianne can help enter that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to break for lunch with a little bit of schedule, but we'll still come back at 1.30 at the um, time that we can post it for the second session. Okay, commissioners, we're going to start with the uh, last few items of the day. First up after lunch is item number 8, LPC 19 3198 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 40, block 42. 424 to 434 Fifth Avenue, aka 1 to 11 West 38th Street, uh, aka 2 14 West 39th Street, Gordon Taylor Building, Individual Landmark. Italian Renaissance Revival Department Store Building. The application is to construct a new competition, mock by the roof, place store for info, install marquees, signage, lighting, and create new window. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Thank you for the preservation staff, and I'm presenting the application for 424 um, Fifth Avenue, better known as the Lord and Taylor Building. It's an individual landmark located between 38th and 39th Street in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I'll just add right to it because of the amount of work we have to describe. Maria Pomela, Pomela, a representative of ownership on the reworks, will first introduce this application to you, followed by Cash Stackover of Higgins and Kreisberg, the consultant of the project, and finally David Holbrook of the PR Ingalls Group, the architect of the proposal. Great, thank you. I'm Maria Camella with the Public Affairs and Policy team at WeWork. Uh, thanks for having us here today. I'll be really brief because I know you guys want to get into the substance, but I do just want to give a little bit of context and history to WeWork in New York City. Um, just so you guys know, the company started in 2010 with one location in Soho. We now have nearly 60 across New York City. Um, the member companies within our walls uh, range all different sizes and industries from entrepreneurs, small businesses, to Fortune 500 companies. Uh, they tend to come to New York not just for the space, design, technology, but access to what is our global community, so the people. And that piece of community is really integral to our company's mission and what drives um, our real desire to be partners at the city <coughs> level, not just here in New York City, but across the globe. Um, and we think it's what you know actually you know, puts us in the, the right position to really respect and honor. I think Lord Taylor is a very significant role in New York City's history. You know, we believe that this is a building that should be experienced and it should be uh, lived in. And it's something that we see as not just an you know, example of great architecture, but an innovative company that provided you know, unique experiences to its employees, as, in addition to also being you know, a cornerstone of commerce on Fifth Avenue. So just a little bit of context to how we're looking to use the space. Um, the basement, first and second floor, is going to be retail. And uh, will be open to the public, um, you know, during business hours. Is this will allow you know people to still use that really magnificent Fifth Avenue entrance. The rest of the building will be office space. It'll be a mix of WeWork and member companies. And we really think that this model is a unique way to really sort of look at the future of retail. So to preserve that spirit while using the entire building. So you know, from our perspective, I think as we've really you know looked at other business, other buildings across New York City, Bryant Park, Fulton Center, you know, our aim here is really to honor the history and the story of the building uh, while building it for the future. So um, thank you for today. I look forward to answering the questions.
Thanks, Maria. Cass, Stackelberg, Hickey, Space Park, and partners. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as Egbert said, uh, Lord and Taylor, uh, individual right. landmark. We're having problems with the open mic, so please support that button. Thank you. So, uh, an individual landmark located uh, on the west side of Fifth Avenue. 38th Street, 39th Street, uh, amongst this uh, wonderful compilation of individual landmarks spanning all the way down from the Empire State Building uh, to the Public Library, 500 uh, Fifth Avenue to the north of that. Um, a site plan, um, again, Fifth Avenue, 38th and 39th Street building um, is a tremendous scale. It occupies uh, more than a quarter of its block, and these blocks between 5th and 6th are 900, a little more than 900 feet long. It's got 260 feet of frontage on 38th, 160 feet of frontage on 39th, and 150 feet of frontage on 5th Avenue. Um, 10 stories, and, and as I said, occupies a large portion uh, of its block. Some existing photographs of the building. So here uh, on the left, this is the 38th Street elevation, 5th Avenue, uh, and then 5th Avenue, and then down here beyond this corner, commercial building, uh, 39th Street elevation. Uh, an Italian Renaissance Revival style, um, designed by Sterrett and Van Vleck, uh, and was completed in uh, 1914. Some existing conditions, just to sort of orient you, uh, at the center, this is the Fifth Avenue entry here, um, underneath the flags, uh, and then a detail of that where the doors open. Um, on either side, on 38th and 39th, there's a, um, a sort of an echo of infill. It's the same infill on both, built on both sides of the building, um, except there are more bays, you'll see this in elevation, there are more bays on the, um, obviously the 38th Street side because of the extent of the elevation. Service uh, on the far west end, the loading bay, and some service entries on the far west end of both elevations. Um, at the ground floor, uh, storefront windows. Um, at the base, all these storefront windows have been closed in with basically like stucco panels, and all that remain are these tiny little latrines. Um, so as part of our work to really open up the building and, and reestablish the connection between the sidewalk and the retail, juices on the inside, all of these will be restored back to their original show window scale, which I think is going to be a real asset to the project. Um, on the far right here, um, there are retail entries on 38th and 39th Street with non-historic fabric canopies. Those will be removed and we're proposing um, new marquees at this entry and a commercial office entry down here, the, uh, the service entries. We'll see more on that in just a minute. Uh, on the upper floors, there's a tremendous amount of restoration work as part of this project. We, we don't get into a lot of detail here because it's all being done in the stack, but I do want to call out a couple of points. One, first of all, you can see louvers across the 38th and 39th Street sides. Those are all going to go away as part of the new program for mechanicals up on the roof. Um, I think more significantly, there are metal windows that were installed in 2003, a few years before designation. They're about 10 inches outboard of the plane of the historic windows. Those are all going to be removed, and we're putting in new uh, insulated glass wood windows as part of the program we're building. So right now, the, the facade is very flat because of the position of those windows. They're all coming out. The brick will be repaired and restored, and new wood windows will be installed in board of those, uh, those metal windows. Um, as well, um, these balcony platforms, um, there are three of these, uh, one on each street elevation. The balustrades and the brackets have all been stripped off, so now they're just strips. So we're restoring the balconies on all three elevations, um, again, to sort of bring back the reading and the legibility of the upper floors uh, of the building. And then, of course, this prominent, wonderful copper cornice that will remain, we're going to inspect, repair, uh, and restore it as required. On the lower right is a, a large um, masonry bulkhead that's off the west edge of the, um, of the roof. Uh, this is a photograph from the roof of an adjacent building, but it's a, it's a feature that we want to actually call attention to, and that will be um, revealed with the rooftop work that we're proposing. Um, some historic views of the building, uh, beginning in 1914 at the time of construction, 1916 and 1940. Um, one thing to point out, originally um, the Fifth Avenue entry was recessed. Um, and by 1914, the, uh, sorry, by 1940, it had been repositioned, and this is relevant to some of the work that we have to do for egress reasons at the Fifth Avenue entry we'll talk about uh, in a minute. Um, 1980 photo, um, and then designation photos. You can see the balconies here that were uh, removed by, by the time of designation. I'll also point out these second floor windows, which end up getting closed in, and, and the configurations changed originally. They were just large, single light windows, which we'll be restoring as well back to the base of the building. 
Uh, a little bit of history of Lord and Taylor, the sort of migration through the city from the Lower East Side. It's an adaptive reuse project on Captain Street to take these fed buildings and, and reuse them for department stores all the way up through obviously the purpose built uh, building on, um, on the Avenue that we're speaking about today. Um, one of the things that we've been fascinated in going through the archival history is the services that were provided to the employees of Warden Taylor as part of this building. There were dental and, and doctor clinics, there were cafeterias and classrooms as part of the services provided to the employees. The building was also known for its um, firsts in terms of things that provided shoppers, but we were particularly drawn, particularly given the culture we were, of the, the services provided to people who worked in the building. And the slide on the lower right, or the image on the lower right, is the central courtyard on the roof, uh, which has been modified significantly over time, but we're going to preserve uh, its volume and the, and the masonry elements that remain. Uh, this was an open area um, for, quote unquote, the care and comfort of the employees of Gordon Taylor. That's really how it will be used in the future for, for the tenants of the uh, 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 a streetscape along uh, the west side of Fifth, just giving you a sense of the varying scales, and as I said, it's a sort of compilation of, of wonderful landmarks from manufacturers and over trust up on uh, 41st all the way down to uh, the Empire State Building. Um, so an overall view here, this is an existing axonometric and a proposed axonometric on the right. Uh, the work uh, that will be visible on the street, really, that will have an effect on the building, really is at the base of the building, it is largely um, geared toward providing proper egress because the egress doors, both into the retail space at the front and the side elevations, are not wide enough to be coded. So we have to make modifications there. And then we're proposing, as I said, uh, two marquees for an office entry and retail entries on 38 and the same uh, on 39. On the roof, um, we're preserving and, and reincorporating the central courtyard. There are three others that have been altered over time. The central courtyard will be preserved at the heart of the roof. And there's a two-story pavilion overbuilt set 150 feet back from the Fifth Avenue facade with mechanicals around a copper screen wall um, set way back off the back of the building. This um, masonry bulkhead now is actually will be exposed, whereas today it's concealed behind um, enclosures of bulkheads that have been constructed over time. Um, comparable existing and proposed elevations really just to point out sort of the, the presence of the louvers, the infill of the windows, and the proposed elevations for the setback addition to the store balcony, and the, the opening up of the ground floor uh, across 38th Street. Similarly, 39th Street, you can see the setback addition, the balconies, and this new transparency or restored transparency at the base of the building that has been lost for, for decades. Uh, and then on Fifth Avenue, um, changes really here at the the existing uh, the proposed changes here to provide um, compliant egress at the front doors and then the setback uh, addition on the roof. Everything really from largely from the streets to the corners will be restoration and some of these modifications at the entries. The rear elevation, uh, the inclusion of a uh, screen wall around the mechanicals that will be largely obscure given uh, current construction on adjacent lots. Uh, roof scope, I'm going to have Dave's. So for the roof design, um, we've got two axonometrics on the left side here, the, the existing roof. So um, you just see the photograph. So on the uh, on the left side, an axonometric of the current uh, conditions. We've got in dark shades the existing uh, eleven-story building of the Terra. Um, on the on the lower side, and on the uh, uh, far uh, west side, on, on, on the left corner, is drawing uh, the bulkheads, which actually come up as the historical bulkheads. Over the past decades, a lot of installations have been um, uh, installed on top of the roof, such as elevator uh, overbuilds, where our um, mechanical uh, units, which have been put up there, uh, like chiller plants and uh, conduits. And over uh, the units, the idea is to um, peel back all the uh, installations which have been put up there over the uh, last couple of decades and um, uh, get, get back to the historical uh, bulkheads, make them visible, um, uh, clean them up, maintain <coughs> the, uh, the masonry on the, on the uh, overbuilt, and make them, uh, make them uh, uh, visible again as they used to be. And then after at the same time clearing up the area in the middle here, which has actually got some, some uh, mechanical units which, which are in the way, take all that away, and then after to make space in the middle for a two-story multifunction uh, overbuild. 
If you want to do function overbuild, it will be uh, open at uh, the terrace level. People will be able to step out into the terrace. We will um, have the terrace uh, slightly raised to um, uh, give us uh, a, a bit of space to reinforce uh, the roof and allow the public or, or rather the, the, the tenants from the offices to step out. The function of the uh, terrace will be very similar as the, the courtyards back in the day. Um, it's recreational space for the people who work inside the building. It's not, uh, not necessarily for the public. It's for the people from inside the building to, to, to step out and, uh, uh, and um, have some recreational space. Now, the, uh, the terrace itself is uh, set back from, from over from the street side here by 20 feet from the Fifth Avenue side by uh, 10 feet, making it uh, not visible from, uh, from street level. The uh, main uh, overbuild in the middle is uh, only minimal visible from certain angles uh, far down 39th Street, um, but standing directly in front of the building uh, on both 38th and 39th Street, the overbuild is uh, not visible. We've got some, uh, some visibility studies uh, later. Then after for egress purpose, we've got the, the, the two uh, stair bulkheads which come up into the uh, terrace. They provide egress for people who are up on the terrace uh, for code, but they also house um, air intake and smoke exhaust, which currently is actually coming out of loopers in the, in the facades. In this facade here, there are several windows which are covered up by louvers. Those are louvers which were also added um, in the past couple of decades, but not original. By removing those uh, louvers and, and allowing the air to, to come in through the bulkheads on the roof, will allow us to, to reinstall uh, the, uh, the historical windows back into the, back into the facade. The position of the stair bulkheads is in line with the uh, current egress situation down on, uh, on street level. Hence, uh, people who, who egress will come out of existing openings on street level. We do not need to install any new uh, openings in the facade and can maintain the, uh, the original uh, retail. Uh, Here are some uh, views of the current conditions uh, on the roof. Uh, there are several uh, smaller courtyards and one uh, large courtyard. The large courtyard is uh, currently um, underneath this, uh, this party tent. This party tent was installed about a year or two ago uh, for the wedding. That will uh, be uh, taken down if we want to uh, restore the uh, central and the largest uh, courtyard. The courtyard itself is uh, 60, uh, 60 feet and has some very nice features which we want to uh, preserve. The other courtyards are smaller, we can have a look at them uh, in, in, in just a minute, uh, but the other small, smaller courtyards, uh, they will be uh, covered. This is uh, a view looking uh, from uh, Fifth Avenue side towards the west. We will see up here um, in the background the historical uh, bulkheads. They will be uh, exposed once we take the uh, uh, elevator overbuild away, which was uh, installed over the last uh, uh, decade. Once that comes down, we can maintain and uh, get, the, get the masonry uh, back into its, 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 its formal uh, shape and appearance. And on this side here, we've got the same view uh, looking across uh, towards the, uh, the southwest. Again, we've got the, uh, the elevator overruns um, on both sides, which will come down. And we've also got lots of mechanical units, such as air handling, uh, uh, air handling units and other mechanical equipment which stays up there, which is up there currently, which we will uh, take down to make space for the other. Um, a close-up view of the existing um, uh, overbuild. Uh, the bulkheads, sorry, the bulkheads have got a lot of uh, nice uh, masonry trim. Uh, exposing that will, will be a benefit to, uh, to the appearance of the building. The central, uh, courtyard, central courtyard has got a lot of uh, very nice uh, features. There's um, uh, an outrigger, Above each single uh, each single uh, column, uh, there's arches, and then arches. Currently, uh, there are uh, windows and doors installed, which were uh, mounted about 20 years ago. We're going to uh, replace them so that it all looks uh, nice and neat. Uh, some of the other uh, courtyards are smaller; uh, they don't have the full height. This is one of the courtyards here. There's, there's a large um, step in it. Other courtyards are, are full with mechanical equipment, and these. Uh, Courtyards are very, very small and also don't have features uh, worth preserving, so they, they will be uh, taken out and they will preserve the, the large courtyard. So, looking at uh, level 11, we've got the, the, the large 60 by 60 uh, courtyard in the center, which we will keep. We will, uh, <coughs> there's also a, a, a very small courtyard at the very far top, north side, 
which we will also preserve to get now that down to uh, level there. Then uh, the terrace level, um, level 12. So uh, we've got a 40 foot setback from the vein um, overbuilt in the middle um, and a 150 uh, foot setback off uh, Fifth Avenue. That will allow us to have an overbuild which is only minimal uh, visible uh, from uh, far down 39th Street and some uh, viewpoints uh, on uh, we've also got the two um, stair bulkheads up here with mechanical um, ventilation <coughs> and air intakes, which I'm speaking about. Uh, the uh, multi-function uh, overbuild has got two levels, <coughs> the base level on, on the terrace level plus uh, a level 13 up here. The level 13 is not the full, the full size of the, of the lower level um, uh, and has a, uh, an area of a which will be a, a, a double access. Then the uh, mechanical units, the new mechanical units, will be positioned in the center on top of the uh, overbuild and will be screened by a, uh, a, a copper um, perforated uh, panel. Um, the perforated panel will allow us to have air intake, which is necessary for the mechanics, but also for neighbors who happen to have their windows at the same height. They will, they will have um, uh, a nice panel which they look at um, instead of seeing the actual, the actual uh, mechanics. The, the copper is an element which we've uh, got on several locations on the building, such as the cornice. It will be installed with uh, small uh, perforated uh, holes in it and uh, uh, darker than, than, this, uh, than this piece of metal. This is just a fresh uh, piece of uh, metal, but we, uh, we can have it so that it is uh, aged. Um, a rendering of the overbuild, we are standing on the Fifth Avenue side, looking down into the courtyards, um, looking across at the back. We've got the, the two-story overbuild with the uh, second floor up here and the, and the 12th floor, which uh, allows people to step out onto the terrace. The terrace itself will have um, paved areas and some uh, planted areas. The planted areas is more seen and small growth and small bushes. Uh, there's no large uh, vegetation plant. And uh, some sections and elevations. Okay. Okay. Some uh, sections and elevations. Um, uh, you can see that the, the actual uh, volume of the view overbuild is very similar to the, to, to the current. So we've got the current uh, elevation on top and the, uh, the current. The same view um, looking uh, from, the, uh, from the south side. Uh, the, uh, the rest uh, elevation. The best elevation that we will take the elevator uh, machine rooms down and we'll, we'll, we'll free up the, the, the area of the side here and knock us between the two historical bulkheads we will have the mechanical screen which speaks with the mechanical bulkheads. Similar from uh, looking towards the west. Then the, the overbuild itself will mainly be uh, a glass uh, curtain wall. We'll go too much into the details. The uh, roof itself, as I said, is, uh, is a raised roof. We'll uh, raise the roof by uh, three foot six in order to uh, allow us to put some uh, reinforcement in there and also uh, get the uh, get the patches in there. Uh, cross section through the courtyard, through the central courtyard, which we're going to keep. The central courtyard has got a lot of uh, details which are worth uh, keeping, such as uh, these outriggers, which uh, will be cleaned up and uh, preserved. And the idea is to uh, keep the arches, take the take the windows which we currently have in there, which are dark, which were added over the years, take them out and reinstall um, clear glass uh, elements so that we can clearly uh, distinguish between uh, new and old and have a clean situation where we where we preserve the arches. Section and detail of what it was. Again, all, all four elevations of the, uh, of the courtyard. One side of the courtyard towards Fifth Avenue is, is in, in the historical situation slightly different. It has larger and bigger openings, which allows us to put uh, uh, doors in there to get, to get a good accessibility out of it. So we have uh, we built a mock-up as you can imagine, and, and um, what one sees there are um, 
photos of the mock-up here and render views uh, on the right of each of these next slides along with a, a zoom view just because the addition actually is very hard to see and largely what you're seeing is, is a portion of the bulkhead. Um, so it's, it's here we are down here, Lord Taylor, and it's really happening, that's the, the stair bulkhead, the southern stair bulkhead, which in a very zoomed photo uh, is, is this element. Um, again, in the sort of natural sort of that they did bronze on green, that will take that it will be a, a dull sort of penny gray, uh, penny brown uh, copper. Um, as a little bit closer uh, into the building, again, you'll see a little of the bulkhead, and as David explained, these are aligned with the stairs directly below. Um, and I think, given the context, really that very, it has very little effect on the reading uh, of the building. As you get closer to the building now, we're at the corner of 39th and 5th. Again, you see the north bulkhead now just peeking up over the side elevation, the masonry elevation. So again, the sort of brown color of that copper, I think, is going to blend nicely with the masonry below. Um, again, now from Madison, so you're a couple hundred feet away, sort of just up in this zone, there's a moment where you see um, uh, the bulkhead. Um, and then down 39th Street, so this is the only location where there's a portion of the uh, addition that's visible. And again, we're talking about um, this is the side elevation here of uh, Lord Taylor. Sorry. Um, we've, uh, we actually color coded the mock up. So, what you see in blue actually is in the background. The, the uh, bulkhead is in black in the foreground. So, the blue is the outer old space, the orange is the railing, and this black is the bulkhead, which is in the foreground. So, really, all you're seeing is the, the railing, which has been tinted for just for this visibility, but this will be clear glass. Notice it, and again, you're probably about 300 feet away from the actual addition of this location. A little bit closer, um, this is all you're seeing, so it's largely the bulkhead over uh, that side elevation. I think it's, it could be characterized as, as minimal, um, but I think more importantly, I think the addition, you know, you do see a little of the addition of the bulkhead, I think thinking about sort of what's the effect on the landmark, it really has uh, a really negligible effect on the architectural character of, of this really large scale building. Off the back side on 39th Street, so now we're down 39th Street. Um, we built a mock up of the uh, mechanical screen. There is construction going on right now in this lot, and we've masked out sort of the, the, this, the massing of that is that the project. So um, pretty soon, and this is now much further along and well above uh, screen level, this uh, screen will be largely uh, blocked. And you actually don't see it really in the context of a landmark because this building is actually the one uh, directly adjacent. So again, it's going to have really very little effect on the building. Um, there, there's a program for signage. Um, there are two locations on the upper floors of the building. We're proposing um, two signs, two separate signage master plans for um, upper floor tenant signage. So historically, there was a, a painted wall sign on this north-facing elevation. Um, what's there today is a dimensional letter that's pin mounted. You can see it here. Uh, in detail uh, onto uh, the side elevation. And what we're proposing is basically to create a box, and you'll see this in elevation here. This is the existing uh, frame around the existing signage. Um, we're proposing to sort of create a frame, an allowable frame, um, set back five feet from the front edge of the building and actually lower than the, uh, than the existing signage in order to sort of clear this terracotta detailing here. Uh, but this would allow for tenant signage uh, much in the same way as, as Lord Taylor had pin mounted signage on that side elevation. Um, and this would be a black, dark, dark finished metal sign. Similarly, on this chamber corner at 38th and 5th, there's signage up here that was added um, sometime in the second half of the 20th century. It's actually letters mounted onto these masonry blocks. So we're proposing to, um, again, um, allow for tenant signage uh, on these upper floors, and we'll get to this in a moment, but there's Lord Taylor signage that's original to the building, right at the Fifth Avenue entry, all that is gonna be preserved, but this signage that has changed over time, we'd like to um, ask that there be a master plan to allow for tenant signage um, on, these, uh, on these upper floors. Um, as well, um, the daylighting that, that David was speaking to about the skylights up on the roof, we're proposing on this um, side elevation again, so this is now west of where that sign was that we were just talking about. Um, some punched openings um, set way back off the Fifth Avenue facade to allow, to allow day, daylight into these um, very large floor plates. The building uh, at its full width is 200 feet. This is about 150 feet. 
So we're trying to come up with ways to get daylight into these uh, upper floors. The proportion of these windows have been taken um, from other openings on side elevations of uh, buildings of this, of this type. Some details for those windows that will be very simple, but as I said, uh, proportionally relating to the window sizing uh, of the building and the adjacent buildings. Um, changes at the, at the ground floor. This is an existing floor plan and a proposed floor plan on the right. Um, as Maria said, there'll be retail use at the ground floor. Um, the way um, the building will operate, there will, there will continue to be retail entries here and here and on Fifth Avenue. This has always served as an egress uh, exit uh, tied into the stair and will remain so. And there'll be office entries down here on 38th and here on 39th Street. So the canopies or mar marquees that we're talking about are uh, over this entry and this entry on each side that are about 150 feet off of the Fifth Avenue frontage. Uh, we also have to make um, changes to some of the infill because of um, requirements for egress. Uh, and you'll see that in just a moment. The, uh, the change related to Fifth Avenue, uh, these door widths right now uh, are 29 inches each feet, and the code requires that they be at least 32 inches where you have air doors and no volume. So um, what we are proposing to do is, is disassemble uh, the infill here, reposition these posts, and install slightly wider doors. Uh, we're also proposing to change the, the retail signage, the Lord Taylor signage, to new uh, retail signage um, at the base. Uh, some existing photos of the infill, it's all bronze, uh, cast, uh, not in great shape currently. Um, from the inside, what's interesting is you can see this whole assembly has um, exposed fasteners. So we think we can actually disassemble this um, and largely uh, reconstruct and reposition, particularly these elements with yours. Uh, will have to be refabricated, but we think we can, uh, we think we can preserve many of the other elements, obviously, the fascia, the dental course, and all the rest of that uh, remains. So we have an existing photo on the right and a rendered view on the, uh, sorry, existing on the left and a rendered view on the right that's just showing the repositioning of the posts slightly inboard in, in elevation. Uh, it looks like we're throwing off a sort of alignment, uh, but because that's outboard of uh, this grill, where there are the vertical elements, we really don't think that you're going to perceive that change too significantly. I'll also remind you that this entry has been pushed out, as you saw from the historic photographs. We think it actually may be the same until it's actually already moved once, and perhaps it was disassembled at that time as well. So we think this is a, an appropriate change and a, and a fairly modest change to allow for uh, required address. It was quick space. Can I ask a question about that? First of all, did you consider pushing it back? Um, the aperture is just as wide, uh, and then you can probably lose because of what's happening. And you can just see this in here, it's right. a different detail. Um, so um, we have a clearance for an outswing door, um, and we'd like to keep this at, at, that, at the Fifth Avenue plane instead of having an open vest pool, which is not wonderful, at least just from a utility standpoint. No, I, no, I understand that, but you, you have a plan, there was space for the vest pool in for uh, there is, there are original, it's hard to see here, there are original show windows here right. that we're proposing to, to maintain. And I don't, you would end up with a vestibule inboard of the, and then you end up losing this element because the heights don't, uh, they don't. Second thing, yes, the signage. Yes, the signage belongs to the retail tenant. Is it, are you envisioning one retail tenant or multiple retail tenants? I think we don't know right now. Yeah. And so the, the sign that was up on the building at the back we were proposing, is so that the retail tender or is that the work sign? Then, so there, there are two different zones of signage. There's the street retail signage, and everything above is office, sort of the tenant. We won't, we won't do retail signage if we've been envisioning it sort of as a tenant sign for the upper floor tenant. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you're correct. So they're, they're sort of separate zones. So there's retail signage at the side. So it's, we, it's not a WeWork sign. It's a WeWork's tenant sign. Or a WeWork sign. We don't, we don't know. Or this one, we, the tenancy, obviously, the building is known, whether it's retail tenants or office tenants. But, but there will be a distinction. It's not going to hold. But if, there's, if there are multiple retail tenants, let's say, do you have provisions for multiple signage opportunities for each of those tenants? I, I think. I think the idea would be there might be detailed signage in the windows that we work with, with the staff on, but we're not going to crowd the columns and piers with different retail signage all the way around the building. We have retail signage at the retail entries, so one on 5th, two, one on 38, and one on 39. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, a whole series of drawings that I'm going to go through quickly, some other detailed photos. As I said, there's also a tremendous amount of restoration work that's going to go along with, um, with this effort. Um, so turning to 38th Street, this is existing 38th Street and proposed 38th Street below. Um, and again, so I think the big, the big change here that's really going to be an enhancement to the building, and I think the past five is taking these infill storefront windows, because there are many of them, and turning them back to single light show windows, which is going to be terrific. We have to um, adjust the, the loading bay, which right now is very narrow, and has to get uh, about a foot and a half wider. Um, changes to egress, this will be uh, the office entry, so there's office tenant, you'll see this in detail here, there'll be a marquee here and here, uh, and then um, show windows and egress doors, similar to what remains now. Um, and then 39th Street, again, similar sentimental, just fewer bays. Um, some uh, existing photos and rendered views of the loading bay. Loading dock right now is just an exposed roll down gate, will be a bronze finished metal door, slightly wider, but now uh, it's currently off center, will align with Keystone. Um, uh, new egress doors, current ones are just hollow metal. Um, and then the entry to the office, so this is noted here for signage as office tenant. Um, with a with just a simple steel canopy extending out over the uh, over the transom windows, um, existing and proposed elevations, um, details of the loading dock, the egress, uh, and the office entry. So there's a vertical uh, pier here, not quite centered in the opening. We're going to reconfigure this opening by shifting this uh, to the west to have two double doors, a fixed panel, and then two double doors on the east side with a canopy or marquee rather uh, above. Um, some details on the marquee, um, illustrating sort of the, the profile. It will be a, a, a painted steel and a, a bronze finish. Um, the retail entry, so right now there's a fabric canopy, both on 38th and 39th. That fabric canopy, uh, which is sort of compresses the opening and changes the, the geometry from what is a rectilinear to feel more arch, um, that will be uh, removed and there'll be a canopy or marquee. Canopy. Sorry, um, and the retail entry with pin lights um, down and the retail signage at that retail entry. Um, and again, we're going to reconfigure uh, the elevation. Sorry, we're going to reconfigure the post to again allow the proper egress with properly sized uh, doors. Um, just as a addressing the sort of appropriate as canopy, certainly the building type uh, we think is uh, can handle uh, uh, canopies. Department stores frequently have canopies. Um, we're in TLM, there's a large projecting portable share at one time on 38th Street. There was a canopy on 39th Street. Um, and then given the scale of the building, we also think it's, it's appropriate to add something um, like this as far away from the pit avenue facade as we're showing. And then examples some other uh, commission approved canopies. This is a, a recent uh, approval uh, on the Altman uh, department store building and then two others. We see a theater a building and, and a university club, and sort of club buildings, so different treatments for very contemporary uh, canopies with new ours is, is appropriate. Um, it doesn't require the removal of any sort of fabric, and the only element that obscures is something that's repeated, the scandal panel is something that's repeated in other days um, directly to the west. Um, some elevation uh, compared to the existing and proposed for that retail entry, again, we have narrow leaves, we have to make it slightly wider, so we're going to reconfigure the posts and have a center fixed white with pair of doors uh, on either side. Uh, the egress door closer to Fifth Avenue, similar story. Um, this is just always been a sort of a, uh, an opaque finish, and this will remain, but we'll provide egress to the stair that runs at the uh, blind wall. Um, and then turning to the repeated set of details. Um, on the 39th Street side of Rowing Bay to all the century. Uh, and then a detailed list of how the retail signage is envisioned, pin down to letters onto the limestone, uh, and replacing non historic light fixtures with new bronze finished uh, light fixtures. And then the last slide we have is just sort of in terms of signage and, and history, I think it's very important to point out that the building, particularly right at that central Fifth Avenue entry, there are these two beautiful cartouches that flank the entry, and then these cast bronze. Uh, crusting with the element T and all that would be made. So, the, so, so the history of Lord Taylor and the presence in this building would be front and center right at that main entry on Fifth Avenue. We think that's very important. Um, and in that effort, along with all the restorative work, we think we're having, we're, we're providing a, 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 a effect on the building actually is a 
terms of enhancement, particularly as one walks around the sidewalk and experiences these show windows and, and the restored upper portions of the sidewalk. Thank you. Are there any questions? We have a few speakers here. So we'll turn to public testimony. And just a reminder that we have three minutes for each speaker. The first speaker is Stephanie Benedetto. Benedetta. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Queen of Raw, and I'm also a WeWork tenant. My business is focused on fashion, sustainability, and based here in New York City, so this conversation is very near and dear to my heart. I was born and raised right outside New York in Greenwich, Connecticut. My family has been in the garment industry in New York since 1896, so well over 100 years. My great-grandfather came over on a ship from Austria, went to Ellis Island, and he settled in the Lower East Side. So I, I grew up here. New York was very much my home. Grew up going with my grandmother and my mother to Lord and Taylor and my sister. Now I live right nearby with my husband and my three-year-old son. So I pass by and see it every day. I've been a WeWork tenant since January 2018. And my family and my team and I sit there and work every single day. We spend all of our time and many, many long hours as a startup, really trying to take advantage of everything that we work at Empire State, which is our location, has to offer. And it isn't just a place where we go to work. It has definitely become my home away from home and completely my startup family. We are always taking advantage of all the incredible networking events and support that we've been provided by WeWork for such a strong sense of community. Most recently, we did win the WeWork Creator Award, so now WeWork, who has been supporting us publicly for quite a long time, has actually also invested in us. And we're looking at opportunities with WeWork about how we can collaborate more in New York City and on a lot of powerful, sustainable initiatives. So they truly do enable us to do what we love doing and really care and are passionate about their community. And it has mean the, meant the world to me. As a born and raised New Yorker, there were actually a number of elements about this Lord and Taylor building that I had no idea about. And uh, you know, learning about it and hearing about it, I can see the beauty of what a historic building it is. And I also see the incredible opportunity to bring some modern elements and tastes back to it and truly balance those two initiatives. And I can't think of anyone that I would support more strongly than we work to be able to balance the perfectly the old with a bit of the new and the refreshing of it. And you know, hearing about how it used to be a place for employees to actually take advantage of the environment in the open air space and enjoy the roof and the insides. And that's very much been a part of the culture and the history of WeWork. It's what they've offered me and enabled me and my team to do every day. So I see that as a truly powerful movement for them. And I, I'm here to fully support them as they have supported me. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Hunt, followed by Kelly Carroll. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. I hope deliberations in in time for everybody to get home for Thanksgiving. My name is Michael Hunt. I'm executive director of EB Research Partnership. We are a tenant member at 575 Fifth Avenue, just up the street from the proposed building. Uh, our organization has one audacious goal, which is to cure the life-threatening disease after Melissa Velosa uh, using an innovative business model of venture philanthropy. Uh, earlier this year, we grew out of our pro bono office space hunched in the back of a donated law firm, and uh, we were in a position to you know, meet the needs of our rapidly expanding organization and find workspace that, that was really a, a really nice fit for us as an organization. What brought us to WeWork originally was their commitment to mission alignment with companies that do good in the world and support companies that do good in the world. And so to help get us in the door, they actually offer a discount to nonprofits to make rent in a city like New York affordable for them. They offered a workspace that uh, helped us really think about how we could limit costs of overhead and infrastructure and technology by providing a really turnkey solution for us. Now, this was all great. They, they really had me at those points. Uh, and I would have been happy to join and move our office there. Then there was this promise of community. 
Now, in medical research, we're taught to be highly skeptical by nature. And I'll admit, I was skeptical of this idea of, of community would really benefit us and further our, our mission, and a very important one at that. In the first week, one of our fellow tenants down the hall was also moving in. We started a conversation, and it turned out this gentleman was a lawyer and immediately offered his services, pro bono legal consulting and connecting us with supporters of our mission. And it didn't stop there. The uh, managers, which are really, uh, the member managers, which are really crucial, important roles in these, in, in these buildings are the catalyst for the sense of community. So they said, how can we help? How can we engage more, more people with your mission? Uh, they threw a reception for us where we got to know everybody on the nine floors of our building to learn about our mission, to volunteer, uh, to engage. This Giving Tuesday, the week from today, which I encourage everybody to participate in for your favorite causes. It's an important holiday on the eve of commercial ones. We work, we'll be writing a story about us and our mission to share our mission with the world. So um, you know, they've really gone above and beyond to help us grow rapidly, uh, to bring new individuals into our mission, and to really be a mission-aligned partner committed to doing good and helping others do good in the world. You know, also in our business, carrying a life-threatening genetic disease that affects children from birth, we think a lot about DNA. And sitting through this presentation today, what I respect is WeWork's commitment, the same commitment that they make to their community members in helping companies grow, they make a commitment to the DNA of a building like this, to respect the historical legacy while also modernizing it to meet the, the needs of companies like mine, you know, rapidly expanding uh, with a very important mission. So we cannot be more thankful for WeWork, what it's done for us and our mission, and when your mission is to cure a devastating and life-threatening disease, uh, we will take the strongest partners that we can get. And we Carol, followed by Jeffrey Roth. Jesse for the Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council conducts the applicants for the restoration work and entrance. And then there's this meeting in the, I'm sorry, and, and does not make the visible whole proportions of the proposed addition do detract from the landmark building in this context. Although we're at my risk of insertion to some bit and tell them the time. On Fifth Avenue, we believe one of the historic window effects should be used at a commercial resident level, either retaining the existing tripartite windows or installing transom windows as seen in some of these historic photographs. Well, the existing Lord and Taylor Lord and Taylor signage is not historic. This iconic building was purpose built for Lord and Taylor. We would like to see some memory of this preserved in the signage. At the very least, then Marcia asked to see specific plans rather than issuing a blanket approval that would be prompt in the parents of tenants. Although not in landmark's purview, we would like to use this public hearing as an opportunity to implore that the plaques memorializing Gordon Taylor employees who died in the World Wars, an important part of visitors' traditional experience of this building, be retained for its own and preserved. Uh, and finally, because it was unclear in the presentation which material, we want to be certain for Warmstone and the claims that the, the family entrance will be preserved in place. Thank you. Jeff Grohl, uh, Director of External Affairs the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Um, I know everybody's been gathered here, so I'll keep it short. Uh, we do have a written testimony. Um, the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce is a community of businesses. We're also a proud tenant of WeWork. Um, for about the last year and a half, our headquarters has been at 575 Fifth Avenue. Uh, the Chamber supports this application uh, for all the upgrades to the Lord and Taylor building made by WeWork uh, because it requires careful consideration about how to preserve and restore the iconic Lord and Taylor building. Importantly, and the Chamber can speak from experience, um, WeWork's efforts at the Lord & Taylor building, along with their other buildings, um, is, is it, makes it, it makes buildings like the Lord & Taylor building um, attractive to modern commercial tenants, especially those that expect high quality office space and modern amenities. Uh, we're thrilled that the basement level, first and second floors, will remain open to the public as public facing retail space, ensuring that the building remains a prominent part of the iconic Fifth Avenue shopping experience. Also, the design of the new canopies, we believe will be more welcoming than they're currently installed, which will improve the experience of those visiting and, importantly, working in the surrounding neighborhoods. This application demonstrates the time and effort to restore the Lord & Taylor building while making it attractive, as I said, to both modern commercial tenants and consumers. And on behalf of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce and our members, I urge the Commission to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Morgan. Morgan Roman, the program member of the Senator at Omni. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the Association for a Better New York, ALPI. We're a 47-year-old civic organization that promotes the effective cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. Uh, we would like to express our support of the application for the renovation of the Lord and Taylor building by WeWork. We believe that WeWork has proposed a very thoughtful renovation to this landmark. As with other department store architecture, the Lord and Taylor building brings classic elements to the street frontage. But unlike its peers, the changes to the Lord and Taylor building over time have created some unfriendly facades, contributing to the relatively unlikely side streets and has abandoned some of the original elements. We believe the proposal by WeWork will bring back the original openness of the facade on all frontages while respectfully updating it for new uses, such as the side entrances for commercial tenants. Also, maintaining the avenue entrance for the ground floor retail instead of converting it to a commercial building entrance was a surprising and very thoughtful contribution to the street life of Fifth Avenue. As recent WeWork tenants, Abbey strongly appreciates the affordable space options, community, and amenities that WeWork brings to an area. We appreciate the addition of critical commercial space here, and while maintaining the iconic landmark that is recognizable to both the community in New York City at large and tourists who visit our city. The application under consideration this morning highlights, well, this afternoon, highlights the emphasis on the amenity space, which we know from the downtown WeWork spaces will bring events, conversations, and members of the public into the space. Additionally, the attention to detail also illustrates a commitment to the building's contributions to the area, improving the view of the building from a variety of perspectives. We believe that the adaptive reuse of this building, along with the design team's sensitive interventions, are appropriate for the individual landmark. We look forward to a productive and inclusive discussion on the proposed development and encourage the commission to support the project. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this application? Okay, we have, uh, we did receive an email through our uh, comments portal uh, with some largely supporting the project, but um, with comments on the, on, on the wall signage referring a script and um, some comments on the canopy. And we also have a letter from the Landmarks Conservancy um, stating that no objection to the proposed group and strongly recommend that the architects include a thorough cleaning of the church facade so as to match any repairs to the original brick color. And um, more the passing of the Lord and Taylor department store. Um, and we appreciate the care of the new owners are proposing to take the building architectural features. And finally, we have a resolution from Community Board 5 um, that recommends denial unless um, three conditions. One, that the uh, rooftop addition design be one next to all. Two, the applicant agrees to eliminate the canopies. Uh, and three, that the applicant agrees to return to the board five for approval of plans for signage as tenants are figured out. So um, I think those are all of the comments we have. Would you like to respond? Briefly. Yes. Uh, so the first uh, point I just want to make is the very black on the interior of the store, which is to uh, memorialize the local water quality here. So it will be a very cool point for a good place for that. Um, um, and just regarding the comment about the second floor windows, so I think you may have noticed that the historic photographs, the second floor windows actually were originally, um, you can see it here, were single light windows. Um, so there were double lungs along the side and single lights here, so we intend to go back to that, um, that original um, condition. The other thing I just thought I'd mention um, is just the treatment of the, the canopies, and I think this is sort of worth noting that given the scale of this building, there are sort of some modest uh, insertions in the base of the building. Um, but we think that the sort of language of those contemporary canopies on the, on the far west ends of the side streets tie in very nicely to the detailing of the roof. Um, so the, the, the interventions are sort of clear and legible and contemporary, and, and the large bulk of the, the other work around the envelope of the building is, is largely restored and or where we are making changes are very much sort of of the building um, with, with noble materials using uh, bronze and uh, other elements that are sort of wood windows that are sort of appropriate for, for this landmark. Uh, this landmark. Any question, Greg? Uh, in response to some of the comments, 
discuss a little bit about your plans for the exterior material restoration to the base up. Sure. Um, so let's just go to the existing photos. Um, so at the, at the base of the building, all the infill is either cast bronze or, or cheap bronze. Um, so the intention is to, to go back to the historic materials and finishes across the base of the building. Um, let's go back. Let's we'll start here. So the limestone is painted. So the limestone is painted. Um, it was just recently finished. I think it was actually coated with a kind. So while we would love to take that off, the, the way to take it off it would probably be microabrasive. Uh, removal and not just paint stripping, and it was just done. Um, so I think the likelihood that we would remove it is unlikely. It is not that great, but I think there's um, some thought among the team to actually improve the color because it's, a, it's hard to read here, but it's a very mustardy color. This is actually while the coating was going on. It's much more sort of yellow than it should be. Um, so I think at the end of the day, we're probably going to recoat it with a better color. Um, windows across uh, these elevations will match the historic. Uh, bronze restoration here. Uh, this is all cast bronze. There, most of these finials are actually missing up here. The smaller ones, those will be restored. Um, and uh, at the window, so these are also sort of bronze framed windows. Those will all either be retained for the framing or repaired in time, replacing kind. And then obviously the show windows will all be opened up again for brick. On the upper floors, the brick is actually, we go to the next slide. The brick is actually in pretty good condition. Um, so. Where we have the removal of these windows, um, there will probably be brick repair. Uh, Robert Bates and Walter Mellon and I were just actually talking about this yesterday. It doesn't appear, we haven't done testing to see what it's going to take to remove one, uh, but it doesn't seem like they were anchored with really tough anchors, so we think we can remove them with, with patching, of maybe sort of more patching, but obviously any brick we put in will really cool match to the clean brick um, adjacent. Uh, and then the limestone, the balconies will be restored. Um, we're, we're still figuring out what the original materials were. We think the brackets and the balusters were terracotta, and the coating was limestone, and that's the intention is to go back to that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question, a few questions about the building and the enlargement at the top of the building. And it has the folding glass curtain wall, optimal glass curtain wall. Is this going to be this for the tenants of the building, or is this going to be some sort of a thing here? This is for tenants in the building. Um, and there's some idea of having these doors actually lift. I think that's correct. Um, to slide, sorry, to open up um, just in good weather. So to sort of have the inside and outside connected. Um, and that's it for the one that loads it's, it's these panels, you know, just just the, the lower level. Yeah, these are fixed. These are fixed and all of those. Uh, I would hope 
that maybe the staff will do a little research that it would be possible to dispose the limestone, especially in the entry, we would have the carvings uh, that span across the painted and on painted areas, and with that area especially for the um, the rooftop uh, addition is honestly visible over the distance of the secondary facade and against the backdrop of higher buildings. So I think it's totally consistent with the kind of thing we, we do at the restoration of the top. courtyard is great. Um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, the signage, the my only minor, minor kind of signage is. I think that uh, there should be no signage on the Fifth uh, Avenue and 38th Street corner on, on the front facade of the building where the historic photos do not show it, uh, or the earlier historic photos do not show it. Um, and I think that the, the, sign, the, the signs that are high up on the building on the back side, facing the west, should be painted and not and mounted, similar again to the original uh, appearance of the building. Yeah, I think just one thing on that, and I'll maybe before you speak to it, um, I believe that while historically it was painted signage and it changed over time, that the zoning doesn't actually allow painted signage, uh, which is why we're together. It's using thin out of letters. Okay. All right. Yes, John. No, no, no. Briefly, I, I, I agree with Michael that there's, I have a thing uh, that has a lot of content there, but I think the, uh, uh, they were uh, meticulous, uh, and I think it would be more protected. The, uh, uh, the rooftop addition, I think, is really contextual. There's a, hardly visible as where it is, because it, it, it hardly matters. Um, I, I, I specifically appreciate what they did with the, uh, the entrances try to adjust to the requirement of expanded doorways. But if you look at the uh, the layout, of course, you're not going to be able to tell anything different from the from the um, And uh, uh, I, I'm completely on board. Fred. Uh, yeah, me too. Completely, uh, thoroughly. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, new life in this building. <clears throat> I don't need to repeat anything that's already been said because I support it wholeheartedly. Said things that were not even mentioned in their comments. I want to say one thing, and that is that I think you know the, the history of New York in many ways is written uh, at least 100 years ago. The history of New York was written by the development of these extraordinary department stores, of which Lord Taylor was one of the most prominent ones. Um, slowly but surely, that era maybe is altering or coming to some sort of a change, and they're being adaptively reused. These buildings, uh, likely most of them are all still around, uh, off of the landmarks. Um, I'm just a big fan of um, <clears throat> the guy on the street being able to know uh, something about the history of our city. And I think, that therefore, unlike some people, I'm, I really like plaques. Um, they don't shout at you. They don't tell you uh, necessarily uh, Thing unless you want to know it, go over and see it back and you read it. So I would hope that there is some way, and I'm not saying it should be applied, but some way working with staff that the great history of this great building and company uh, can be uh, made still alive, at least in history, uh, through uh, through some means that again working with staff to figure out. And not uh, I'm glad for the testimony that suggested that the World War I uh, veterans will be maintained somewhere appropriately. I'm not sure that will be true. I just hope that the uh, what I'm talking about can be done without even entering the building somehow. It's just the pastor's life that that would be good if they chose to go over and see something and say, oh my goodness, I had no idea. So anyway, that's, that would be my one uh, additional suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, just the the, uh, the question of could a painted sign be installed instead of the pin number on the uh, return of the facade? It, it appears that you could install a painted sign. I think there are some locational uh, criteria that must be met for grandfather conditions that the applicant could explain better than I could. But 
Um, just, you know, if, if you look at page 53, I don't even put that up, up on the screen. The painted sign was uh, to the right of the, sort of the decorative pattern brickwork. The current pin mounted sign, which has also been there for some time now, is on that pattern brickwork. So I think it would be, you have to get it understand if it were painted instead of pin mounted, where we would be and things like that. So that's the, the background. I just want to echo what uh, Fred said. Uh, I think that uh, seeing that uh, Ron Taylor started in present day Chinatown and actually some seems to be a little bit more style. Both met their demise on the broad avenue. So I think it is important that I, I, I'm totally fine with the illustrative work, uh, but I think that the comment about that the future generation knows about the struggle of the evolution. Is, uh, that is a, uh, you're welcome to put on your time counter. This is a lot of flowery as well. Great. And I, I think, you know, this is a sort of perfect adaptive release project. It's just very, a very restorative approach on the silence, opening up the store ones again, restoring uh, the balcony, as we've released really some really good international story movies. I think are all really going to enhance the building.
and that the proposed marquees will be included in the scale and placement of Grand Star Castle. That the proposed marquees can fit the masonry and the buildings without altering any architectural details, and that the minimalist design, bronze finish, and integral lighting will relate harmoniously with the historic facades. And that the new light fixtures located east at each bay of the primary facades are simple in design, modest in size, and will have a dark finish to blend the overall color palette of the ground floor. With regard to the signage and then approval, finding that the existing pin mounted metal tenant signage at both the secondary north facade and southeast corner of the primary facade are old, are not original to the building, and their removal will not eliminate any significant architectural or historic features. That the historic building tailored signature carved into the masonry above the display windows will be maintained, thereby retaining the historic and art historic association with the building. That there is this extensive history of a large wall mounted sign at the secondary north facade and at the southeast corner that documents the historic photographs, and that proposed pin mounted metal dimension letters at these locations will be in keeping with this historic signage in terms of size, placement, dark finish, and method of attachment. That the pin mounted side blocks of the ground floor will be installed adjacent to the entrances and will be keeping with the types of signs historically found by buildings of this type, style, and age. And that the establishment of a master plan for signage will provide a template for future installations as tenants change over time. Sunlight. Um, 
which would be a smaller footprint. Um, there were some ideas thrown around that a masonry room or decorative uh, enclosure, which would enlarge the footprint. We kind of chose the middle, middle of the road, which is matching the adjacent bulkhead and uh, kind of middle of the road size in the enclosure. Are
So as an effort to provide an accessible interior space, uh, we create a um, huge ramp to connect between A and C. However, um, B is a given condition and is an accessible, this is only from the second avenue. Although A and C is not uh, accessible from uh, any of the 41st Street or second avenue, that's why we are asking to uh, permit uh, uh, accessibility ramp in uh, 41st Street side so that the uh, entire space can be accessible for uh, any disabled person. Um, with the um, consideration to have the AD accessible ramp interior, uh, we did the archives research. However, as you can see, the building uh, structure is uh, located at the corner. Uh, which is higher than the pedestrian streetway. So we had to install the ramp outside the building. Uh, this is technical elevation drawings of the uh, ramp that we are proposing. Uh, very minimum uh, pipe structure and uh, the ramp itself is about seven inch difference from the pedestrian walkway. Um, so we try to have minimum design to include any of the existing context. Uh, this is the final rendering of the ramp installed. This is the interior view that shows the uh, level difference and uh, the ramp that connects the A to C. And the uh, photo on the right hand side is the uh, photo from uh, level B through the both A and C. Thank you.